Welcome back to ESPN on ABC College Football presented by Kay Jewelers. A historic day in college football with uh, us being 24 hours away from the playoff committee announcing it's uh, four teams that will make it in the college football playoff. All these games today impact Kansas State Baylor on ESPN tonight, ABC, the Dr. Pepper ACC championship game. And if Wisconsin were to knock off Ohio State, and if Florida State were to lose, would that open a door maybe to two Big 12 teams, despite the fact this conference doesn't even have a championship game? If TCU wins, it will share the Big 12 title with either Kansas State or Baylor. TCU won the toss and deferred, so Iowa State will get the ball first. Here's Aaron Wimberly on the return. And Wimberly is out past the 20 and knocked down at the 23-yard line. Well, if Iowa State is going to have any chance in this game, it will be because of its quarterback, Sam B. Richardson, who's had a solid year. 18 touchdown passes, only eight picks. He's thrown a touchdown pass in nine consecutive games. Yeah, we were talking with Mark Mangino, the first-year offensive coordinator of the Cyclones, and he said, you know, the biggest struggle for Sam B. Richardson has been he had a, a shoulder injury a couple of weeks ago, and he hasn't, you see Mark Mangino, he hasn't had the ability to lift in the weight room and get that strength back in that shoulder, so something to keep an eye on in this game. Richardson is a junior from Florida. He will throw on first down, and the pass to the sideline incomplete intended for DeVario Montgomery. Iowa State playing without arguably its best offensive player outside of Richardson, and that's tight end E.J. Bibbs. Suffered a knee injury in camp, came back, but then was injured again against West Virginia, and he is done for the season. Yeah, that's a huge blow. You see there, eight touchdown catches. He's one of those mismatches uh, that just can't account for him in the secondary. Got to run Wimberley, and he's grabbed and thrown down by Paul Dawson, the Big 12 Defensive Player of the Week, who has been fantastic all season. And you could argue the best linebacker in all the Big 12. There he is. He's going to shoot the gap. Outstanding at recognition and reading. I and mean, yes, you get as it be a senior in college. You have the physical traits, the speed, but then you start to have the knowledge on top of it. And that's what Paul Dawson has added to the equation. Second in the Big 12 in tackles. His ability to diagnose plays and shoot gaps. So a third and seven here for Iowa State. Richardson with time, going to throw deep. And it's overshot. There was double coverage on Devario Montgomery. So a three and out by Iowa State. And then the potent TCU offense will step on the field here momentarily. Cameron Eccles Luber, who has a punt return for a touchdown, which was the winning score at Kansas, a game you mentioned earlier where TCU didn't play great on the road, but ended up winning by four points. And a fair catch made at the 30-yard line. TCU, arguably the most improved team in college football. You could make a case that Trevon Boykin is the most improved player in the country. Last year, seven touchdowns, seven picks. This year, six picks, but 26 touchdowns. And he's one touchdown pass away from tying Andy Dalton's school record for 27 in a season. For me as a quarterback, it's been a lot of fun watching Trevon Boykin grow. From a year ago, seven touchdowns and seven interceptions to the year that he's having this, this season. Obviously, having Doug Meacham and Sonny Cumbie, the co-offensive coordinators, has helped him immensely. And a swing pass to Aaron Green on first down. Out past the 35. Gain of about eight for Green, who replaces the injured B.J. Catalan who is missing his fourth straight game with a head injury at running back. I think people underestimate how difficult it is to make that transition from wide receiver to quarterback. We saw Devin Gardner right at Michigan make that transition, and it didn't work out so well. It is not easy to do what Trevon Boykin has done this year, even if you were a trained quarterback. And we'll shovel pass to Green, and he has stood up and brought down for maybe a half a yard gain. So third down here, big third down for Iowa State. Vernell Trent on the stop. 
TCU has won six straight since that three-point loss against Baylor back on October 11th, a game in which they blew a 21-point lead with 11 minutes to go. We'll talk more about that as we go along as to what happened in that game and what the committee saw when they watched that game by still placing TCU ahead of Baylor in the college football playoff ranking. And on third down, a big hit at the point of attack by safety Darian Cotton, airlifting Aaron Green and dropping him for no gain. It's fourth down. Darian Cotton goes 5'11", 198 pounds. He comes down in the box, third and short. He's right here. He's just going to kind of sugar down here. Great insert from the safety position. That is the definition of a form tackle. And a definition of a favorable spot. <laughs> I didn't even measure. First down. Wow. Boykin has all day. Going to air it out. Got listen me. Incomplete. Kenneth Lynn in coverage. That's the first shot downfield of this one. Many more to come. And if you give this much time in the pocket, you're going to have these throws downfield. I think that was a little bit underthrown. Listen, be one of the fastest players on this team, a track star. If that ball were thrown five, six more yards downfield, he would have had a chance to run underneath it. Here's Green off the left edge. And good tackle in the open field as Drake Furch was able to get off a block and make a play. So we'll bring up third down and long for TCU, number three in the country in scoring. They were 88th last year, fifth in total offense. They were 104th a year ago, a four-win season last year, and they're at 10-1. Coming into this game, 7-1 and one in the Big 12 tie with Baylor and K-State. Boykin with time and going to throw a deep fade and it is caught out of bounds. Incomplete. Josh Doxson, the intended receiver. Coverage by Sam E. Richardson and TCU will punt. And what a great stop here by Iowa State. First drive. Richardson in good position. Doesn't look back for the football, but you know, these, these fade routes, TCU has made a living all year throwing fade routes. In third down situations, you know, you throw that ball up and you've got some great athletes in Dachshund, but you're not always going to come down with that ball. And a short punt. And caught at the 20-yard line by Jarvis West. So that's where Iowa State will start its second possession after a 37-yard punt. No return. Well, tonight on ABC, it's the Dr. Pepper ACC Championship game. Florida State dropping to number four in the college football playoff ranking despite being still undefeated. But we'll see tonight if they can knock off the Yellow Jackets. TCU, we talked about how good it's been on offense, but TCU underrated as a defense. One of the top teams in the country when it comes to takeaways. And they're third in the nation in tackles for a loss. Richardson with a completion and a gain of about five yards to Devario Montgomery to the 25-yard line. You know, I think the thing that sticks out to me about this TCU defense is not necessarily the front four. I don't think they're the best front four in the Big 12, but the back seven. They have players at the linebacker position with Paul Dawson, safety Sam Carter, Derek Kindred, Chris Hackett. That's where those turnovers come from, Dave. Richardson and a catch made by Montgomery fighting for the first down and appears to have it at the 32-yard line. You know, guys, as you look at TCU's defense, from my vantage point, you know, everybody's talking about the eye test. This is not a big defense. They're small on the perimeter. The linebackers are undersized. They don't have a lot of depth in the defensive front. And Gary Patterson acknowledged that. This was a three- to five-year plan. they got to get bigger. They've got to get deeper. This is a team that can run, and they've got great quickness, but it's not a team that's going to overwhelm you, overwhelm you physically. And in trouble is Richardson as he is tackled for a loss of about six, Marcus Mallett, who has had an outstanding year with now 11 tackles for a loss, he was in the backfield. Yeah, and he's one of those players, again, we saw Paul Dawson in recognition, now look at Mallett in recognition. He reads that play from the very beginning. His eyes are disciplined, and we know this is a smaller defense, as Tom was saying, but you know one thing about TCU on defense. They are going to be well coached. Gary Patterson will have them in the right position, and their eyes will be disciplined, and that's why they have so much success. Second down and 14 on a slant. Richardson's pass is knocked down, incomplete. 
One of those uh, small corners that Tom was talking about, 5'10", 170-pound freshman, Ranthony Tejada. Yeah, and they've been looking for that guy to replace Jason Verrett. First round draft choice of the Chargers. He was a Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year a year ago, and Tejada's been up and down. They've got some true freshmen in Nick Orr and Torrance Mosley that have played some, but they've got to find that guy opposite Kevin White, especially if they get into that top four in the playoff. Third down and 14. Richardson in the pocket, going to throw underneath. And a great stick by Sam Carter on Wimberley. So that will bring up a punting situation again here for Iowa State. You know, Brian, you reference, you know, the defensive secondary. And each and every week on Film Room on ESPNU, we've done a lot of focus on TCU secondary and how they play play man-to-man -man defense. True inside technique, man-to-man, -man, no bail, no peeking at the quarterback. It is how you teach it. And so if you throw into their man-to-man -man coverage, you better be on point because guys are going to be stuck to others like glue. First punt for Downing went 45 yards. And another good kick here. Eccles Luber elected not to signal for a fair catch. He juggled it, but still gained about five yards to the 30. So that's where TCU will start its second offensive series of the first quarter. Couple of great TCU quarterbacks slinging Sammy Baugh and Davey O'Brien. And speaking of Davey O'Brien, Trevon Boykin, a Davey O'Brien finalist that goes to the top quarterback in college football. Boykin, a big reason why this TCU offense is totally different here in 2014. Look at the scoring, 21 points per game more this season. No huddle is way up. That's because the offense has changed more on that after this play. Boykin pulls it back and going to sling it toward the sideline, and it's on the money. Pulled in by Josh Doxson, his team leading 51st catch. You see the arm strength of Trevon Boykin. This is from the opposite hash, a comeback, 18 back to 17 yards. This ball thrown on a rope. Great accuracy and arm strength from Trevon Boykin. We talked about the increase in no huddle. Here's the up-tempo. This might be a double pass thrown out into the flat and now throwing it back to Boykin. And he's got six blockers in front inside the Iowa State 30. And Boykin will take it all the way. Touchdown, TCU. There's some style points for you on the first score. David Porter with the touchdown pass to Boykin. He can beat you in so many ways with his feet, with his arm, as a receiver. We know that he's had so much success as a receiver at TCU. You just cannot keep take your eyes off of number two at any point if you're playing him on defense. Overcrow makes it 7-0, Horn Frogs. Well, you said they had to make a statement. I don't know if this is what you meant. Thank you. <laughs> it helps. <laughs> Porter throws it back, and Boykin does the rest with the bigs out there blocking for him. Well, we mentioned that Trevon Boykin is a former receiver and running back, but that's his first career receiving touchdown on a backwards pass initially thrown to David Porter. And then the senior throws it to Boykin. And then he had only purple jerseys out there blocking just a couple of white shirts and wanted no part of Boykin. Couldn't catch him down the sideline. 55-yard scamper. And that's something different this year, in my opinion, with this TCU offense, is the creativity that Doug Meacham has brought. You never know what's going to happen uh, when they snap the football. And a touchback, it will come out to the 25. And a backwards pass. you got to make sure as a quarterback, you make sure you throw that ball backwards. Watch as Trevon Boykin, you can roll it, guys. And you get a step up, make sure, a little step up to make sure he throws it back. And then when this ball gets back, take a look at the caravan here of linemen in front of Trevon Boykin. That's just not fair. You see the speed of Boykin down the edge. You know, I think what was interesting in talking with Doug Meacham and Sonny Cumbie is Doug Meacham is the, is the creative part of the offensive coordinator and and Sonny Cumby is more the detail oriented guy so you have a great play like that an innovative design but Cumbie's the one that's really teaching the details of those plays Richardson a throw on first down and has another completion to Montgomery and Montgomery won't go down finally tackled at the 42 a 17-yard gain 
I do find it interesting that TCU, which has done whatever it has wanted this year, just running its offense, throws a trick play out there. You know, that's them, though, right? I mean, that's uh, I and I I would be the same way if I'm coming out and playing a game. Anytime I I take my offense onto the field, uh, we're going to play we're going to play aggressive. We're going to be creative and innovative, and and don't hold anything back. Montgomery hurt in the last play. That's been the story of Iowa State season. Just too many injuries. Wimberley looking for a hole. Or excuse me, Devondrick Neely, the backup tailback. He's out to the 45 for a gain of three. Mentioned Biggs is out in the Montgomery with a knee injury. Early in the year, Iowa State almost beat Kansas State week two. And at that point, people thought, hey, the Cyclones, maybe they'll be a team that you know, has a 500 squad of the Big 12. But they have not won a league game. They're 2-9 and nine overall. They did beat Iowa early in the season. That was after the Kansas State loss. And here's a pass that again is on the money. Tad Ekby with the catch. And it's an Iowa State first down in TCU territory at the 47-yard line. Well, this is great anticipation from Richardson. Take a look. This ball is out of his hands before the receiver comes out of the break. You cannot guard against that. And, you know, there's a lot of impressive things about Sam B. Richardson. And certainly the season hasn't gone the way he would like, but he's been impressive. He'll keep it on the ground here with Neely, and he is wrapped up and thrown down. No gain on the play. And Mallet in there for TCU. And, you know, we talked about Richardson. We talked about the first year for Mark Mangino at Iowa State, and those two working together had a big uh, impact on the impressive season that uh, Richardson has had. The question is now, without Bibbs, Montgomery now on the sideline with a potential knee, where is the playmaking going to come from at the skill positions for Iowa State? On second and ten, another pass play. Richardson in trouble, and his pass was deflected. It appeared at the line of scrimmage, intended for Neely, and then a little push from Paul Dawson. So it's third down and ten. Now, despite the poor year for Iowa State, and now five and eighteen over the last two years, two and fifteen in the Big Twelve. The head coach Paul Rhodes got a vote of confidence from the athletic director this week. He did go to bowl games in three of his first four years. The local guy, and they're hoping that. They can get back on track in 2015. Third down and 10. Richardson, and man was open, and the pass is caught at the 40. It's fourth and five, Wimberley on the catch. If you're Iowa State, just go for it here. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think there's any hesitation from Paul Rhodes, and well, he's gonna punt it. He's gonna punt this football, which, I mean, I understand the percentages here, but with what's at stake in your season, I think I would go for it. And you know you're going to need to score points. I don't think field position really is an issue. I don't think TCU <laughs> cares where it starts. Holden Kramer, the backup punter, is in. And it's interesting that you saw him run in the game as uh, this doesn't really work out that well for Iowa State. It's down to the 14. The quarterback wears number 12. He ran out of the game. Another number 12 came in. The backup punter. How rare, it's rare you see that. That's why first I kind of hesitate. Well, are they going for it or not? Number 12 is in the game. <laughs> is the backup punter. So now TCU will start at its 14-yard line. Trevon Boykin with 35 touchdowns responsible for. That is a school record, breaking Andy Dalton's mark that he set in the Rose Bowl season of 2010-2011. They went 13-0 with Dalton as the quarterback. And Boykin with a quick throw to Porter out in the flat. And he is pushed out after a gain of about three yards by Furch. There you see Doug Meacham, the uh, first-year offensive coordinator, came over from Houston last year. Previous eight years at Oklahoma State, the wide receiver coach. This is the air raid offense. I, I don't know that Doug Meach with Sonny Cumbie could have ever anticipated that this season would go as well as it has. Boykin finding Green, trying to cut and get the first down. He does out to the 27-yard line. Well, Sonny Cumbie, a great quarterback at Texas Tech, had success in the Arena League as a player. And he's in his first year as the co-offensive coordinator here at TCU. Got the visor in the uh, press box. You know, a lot, of, a lot of sun up there. <laughs> Those guys have been awesome together. You know, you bring two coaches together, you never know what's going to happen. Their ego is going to mesh, but they, it's been pretty cool to see. There's Boykin. 
And Boykin brought down to the 32-yard line, so a gain of five on the play. No, guys, you take a look at Doug Meacham on the sideline. Look at his little play sheet. You know, this is this is simplicity made to look complex. They got their base plays. They're going to make adjustments, and they've got a dynamic quarterback in Trevon Boykin as he flips it out. They're just playing pits and catch. But, guys, I think the biggest adjustments that you'll see within this offense and have seen is their ability to give Trevon Boykin answers versus pressure. He's been the most efficient quarterback versus the Blitz in the Big 12 all season long, and he can run the football, which really creates problems for your coverage packages. Fresh set of downs here for TCU on the 43, and Boykin throws underneath. And Deontay Gray has been battling an ankle injury, just one catch in those last three games. Picks up about seven. I think Gary Patterson deserves the most credit because he decided to go against his gut, against what he knows, to go with this up-tempo, air raid-style offense. Another swing pass. Here's Hicks, first down into TCU territory at the 45-yard line. Well, I think I think there is a little bit of a misnomer uh, with this era. This is not just the air raid offense. Certainly, that's been the background, uh, but what's been different, and I think Gary Patterson's had a big role in this, is the run element, the option zone read element. Gary Patterson was kind of, a, as a defensive coach, went to Sonny Cumbie, Doug Meach, and said, look, man, this guy can really run the ball. You might want to implement some option, and that's not something that's normally characterized with this air raid offense. Double move here. Boykin, though, when everybody covered, takes off. Boykin at the 40. And he picks up seven yards to the 38. But really, that's that's the difference maker for this offense, in my opinion, has been the, the legs of Trevon Boykin. And quite frankly, I don't think that a whole lot of people thought that he was going to come into this season and be as accurate as he has been, especially downfield, and how, how strong his arm is. And then you add into that, he's starting to, to diagnose defenses, go through progressions, do all the things that a traditional quarterback needs to do. When you put all that together, uh, he's going to be in New York at the Heisman ceremony. Here's Green, got the first down to the 30-yard line. Well, Boykin is uh, number one in the Big 12 and fourth in the country in total offense. And he was named this week a Walter Camp finalist along with Melvin Gordon, Marcus Mariota, Amari Cooper, and Scooby Wright. It's pretty good company. For Boykin, and obviously with the injury to JT Barrett, that'll open up a spot in New York if Boykin wasn't already in that mix. Boykin with time, and a long throw that is nearly intercepted. A diving attempt by Kenneth Lynn. See if it hit the ground. Official says it did. Doxon was the intended receiver. Javon Boykin was reading the other side of the field and came back late. It's one thing that I've seen on film from him that I didn't like was sometimes he will flip from all the way from one side of the field to the other and he trusts his arm so much and how strong it is that he can muscle that ball in. But when you do that and especially throwing from the opposite hash to the outside of the numbers, you bring into equation a corner that can break and get in front of that football. Can you get away with that against Ekpley Olamu of Oregon if they meet in the playoff? And wide open in the middle of the field is Doxon inside the 10 and tripped up just shy of the seven yard line by Drake Birch, but it'll be a first and goal for TCU. Great job, zero pressure, identify the blitz, flip it out to your best player, Josh Doxon. They run a little rub route on the outside, which is a great call against zero pressure. Those are the kinds of plays that earlier in the season this offense was not making, but they are now. Working his way inside the five and breaking tackles is Aaron Green inside the two. Second down and goal. Again, I don't know that Iowa State would have scored or if it failed to convert on fourth down, we wouldn't have the same result, but you would have liked to have seen Iowa State at least fight there and go for it on fourth down and try to keep that TCU offense off the field because you know how quickly they can get points. They're a heartbeat away from a 14-0 lead here in the first quarter. Green to the end zone. Touchdown, Horn Frogs. The eighth rushing touchdown for Aaron Green. You know, B.J. Catlon has not played since that West Virginia game where he had the concussion. It's been Aaron Green, Travoris Johnson, Kyle Hicks. Those three guys have picked up the load, and they've done it in impressive fashion. 
over Chrome on for the point after. And it's 14 to nothing, TCU. Horn Frogs trying to get to 11 and 1. Now, I think one of the most impressive things, Dave, to, uh, of this TCU team, after that Baylor loss, where they kind of melted down in the fourth quarter a little bit, each and every week since then, they've gotten better, and they've gotten better in the areas where they struggled earlier in the year, specifically on the offensive side with Trevon Boykin, diagnosing pressure and taking advantage of those things. And, and I think on a consistent basis, that's happened outside of the Kansas game. Yeah. Uh, they've done it pretty much every week. But everybody's had a close game yeah. that, that's in the top seven. And the college football playoff committee obviously has watched the film. They, they're looking at tape and breaking down TCU. And that's why they put TCU three spots ahead of Baylor. And a great example in that last drive was the, the, the pass to Josh Doxson. Look, there's nobody in the middle of the field. That means you got all-out pressure, and they make a nice adjustment on the outside, little rubber out, get the ball to your best player in Josh Doxson. This is the kind of blitz they struggle with against Baylor, and since then, they have had an answer. We talked with Sonny Cumbie, Doug Meacham. They said we didn't have enough answers to that pressure on offense in that game. And since then, they have come into each game with not one, not two, but three or four options against that all-out pressure, and it benefited them there. Iowa State winless in the Big 12. Does it have any life left? Down 14-0. Wimberly off the left side. And he's to the second level and might have a first down at the 35-yard line. No, and guys, to add to that zero pressure look, did you see the splits of the receivers? Both receiving targets were on the numbers or wider, which really simplifies the read for the quarterback. It's a great setup pre-snap from Doug Meacham. Richardson in the pocket, overthrown, and did it hit the ground? No, it's picked off, intercepted by Chris Hackett. His seventh interception of the year that leads the Big 12. And that is takeaway number 35 for TCU on the year. That's what they do defensively. They take the ball away from you. Richardson was trying to throw the football to Ben Boson, who's only running routes because of Bibbs being out of this game. Looked like he was getting held by Mallet, but the ball. Try to anticipate throws, and when the receiver doesn't get to where you want the ball want the ball to be, then you're going to have problems with safeties behind it. And I don't, I'm not so sure that Hackett came up with that football. Yeah, they're looking at this further, and it appeared that it hit the ground. He didn't control it. Again, the ball can Previous hit the ground. Previous play is under control. further review. If you have control, it can hit the ground, but as soon as you lose control, or if you never had it, obviously, then it's an incompletion. It has to be... Uh, Video evidence that overturns this uh, shows enough to overturn it, and I, I, th I think that's an incompletion. Yeah. Whether this stands or not, Hackett has been outstanding at intercepting the football. As you mentioned, leads the Big 12 with six of them already. Just seems to always be around the ball, and both he, Hackett, Carter, Kindred, all three of them have been outstanding this year for Gary Patterson in this, in this secondary. And not just in forcing turnovers, but tackling in the open field. They're three of the best tacklers from the safety position in all of college football, and they're all on the same team. It's really a remarkable turnaround. This is a program that the last couple years had struggled. Last year, four and eight. They were trying to figure out what to do with Trevon Boykin, what position he should play. You know, it's senior day, but they don't have a lot of seniors. It's a young team. Now, on offense, uh, of, of their starting players, they have only three seniors. Their whole offensive line is back la uh, next year. Boykin's back. All their running backs return. David Porter is the only senior in the receiving core. They got their place kicker back. They'll lose Dawson and Carter, along with Kevin White. But they've got a lot of guys on defense that will return next year. And they have some true freshmen that are really coming on, like Emmanuel Porter. After the receiver review, position. the ball hit the ground. It's an incomplete pass. Second down. So the call is reversed. It'll be second down and 10 at the Iowa State 35. Late here in the first quarter, 14-0 TCU.
Iowa State has played in some close games. We mentioned the Kansas State game early in the year. Lost by four. Lost to Texas only by three. To Texas Tech only by three. But with Bibbs out, Montgomery shaken up earlier in the game. And now down 14 points. Do they have the firepower to not only come back, but then keep TCU off the scoreboard? Richardson pumping and has a completion near midfield. Montgomery back out there. And he's still banged up, trying to fight through it. And it's a gain of 14. And the only way that uh, you had an opportunity, Richardson did, to throw this ball is the protection up front. Nice job by the offensive line. Good job. Montgomery just finding a hole there and takes another hit on that knee. TCU blitzing, and they run right into it, and Dawson hog ties Aaron Wimberly and gets him to the ground for a loss of the play. We've seen this consistently with Paul Dawson. He's hiding over here behind the backside. He's going to come through and just times it perfectly. Look at the safety and the linebacker move at the same time, Dave. That tells you that's a well-coached defense. When those two guys, there's a key. They'll watch the quarterback, and maybe the quarterback puts his hands under the center or he calls for the ball, and that's the key for the defense to rotate. And Paul Dawson's one of the best in college football doing it. Another negative play by Iowa State. Here they get positive yardage. Wimberly breaking tackles inside the 35. And TCU finally gets him out of bounds at the 30-yard line. So for the second time here in the first quarter, Iowa State crosses midfield after a 25-yard run. Well, it never fails. You say a guy's a good tackler and hack it, and he comes up number one and misses the tackle. <laughs> Hadn't had much this year. Now let's see if the Cyclones can do something here and get points. Wimberley, he gets swallowed. Dawson and Mike Tua Ua greet the running back at the point of attack and drop him for no gain. You know, when you see two guys unblocked in the backfield, normally what that is, you say it's the offensive line, but a lot of times that's a back that doesn't keep a play designed to go to the front side on the front side. He tries to cut it back, and that's not where your blockers are, and that's exactly what happened to Wimberly. Wimberly, a senior, running back out of Georgia. Second down and 10 for Iowa State. Richardson with time, again an over-the-middle pass. And it's caught at the 21 by Jarvis West. He's short of the first down. Third down and a yard here for Iowa State inside a minute to go in the opening quarter. It's a big play here for Iowa State. They're over three so far in third down. Do have over 100 yards of total offense though here in the opening quarter. And the play clock down to five. Richardson. And the catch made for a first down at the 18-yard line. That's true freshman Alan Lazard, his 44th catch of the year. And Iowa State, at the end of the first quarter, is in the red zone. Well, that tells you a little bit of something. Third down and one. They don't hand it off to Wimberley. They throw the ball. That's pretty much been the way it's been all year for Mark Mangino and Paul Rhodes. But Lazard, a 6'5", 220-pound freshman, great hands. 14-0, TCU in control after one. ESPN on ABC College Football, presented by K Jewelers, will continue after this message. And a word from our ABC stations. Help us beat cancer. The V Foundation awards 100% of direct donations and net proceeds of events to fund cancer research. Log on to www.jimmyv.org or call 1-800-4-JIMMY-V to donate. With Brian Gracie, Tom Lugan, Bill Dave Pash here in Fort Worth, Texas, where TCU has a Big 12 championship and a spot in the college football playoff on the line. 14-0 the Horned Frogs lead, but Iowa State in the red zone. Richards into the air. Working to the left side and wide open is Wimberly for a first down inside the 10. Pushed out at the six-yard line. It'll be first and goal. 
Great read from Sam Richardson. He wanted to push the ball downfield into the end zone to Lazard, but Mark Mangino's coached him up well. In this area of the field, it's touchdown, check down, touchdown, check down. If it's there, take a shot. If not, find your check down, and it gets you some good yardage for another first down. And as we mentioned, if Iowa State's going to have any shot, Richardson, who's very capable, has to play well. He's been sharp so far, and a first and goal now for the Cyclones. This is where they've struggled. Obviously not a great running team, and down here you would love to have a running game, but you got to throw it. Going to hand it to Wimberley, but a penalty marker down. Looks like it'll be a delay of game. Trying to get a timeout. Paul Rhodes delay. on the sideline. Offense. Five yard yeah, he's saying, I called the timeout. He was running down the field. He saw the play clock, and he was trying to run down the field to get a timeout. Now he's upset because he's saying, hey, man, did you hear me? But really, that, that shouldn't happen. I, I guess when you're 2 and 9, these kind of things do happen. But, I mean, you just got a first down at the six-yard line. It's not like you got to run down the field and take time to huddle. And It's on the quarterback. Quarterback has to make your right. The play clock is right in front of him. You can't ignore it. Well, first and goal from the 10 now. And Richardson keeping it. And down he goes for a loss. Another negative play. Chucky Hunter trying to get the quarterback down initially. Could not, but then dropped him. A one-yard setback. Second and goal. Now these defensive linemen now with the advent of the zone read, it's hard on them. They don't get blocked, and they run free into the backfield, and they're, they want to make a play, and they're so excited. And then you got to read the mesh and find out who's got the ball, and Chucky Hunter did a great job. Richardson with time, end zone pass, incomplete. Drop by Ben Bozen. Doesn't have a catch this year, and I guarantee you that's EJ Bibbs, who normally plays that position. That's six. Well, you know, if you're wearing the number 95, there might be a good chance you're not going to catch that ball. <laughs> I mean, you, you, know, you know, he probably didn't start a tight end. That ball is thrown right on the money. Great read from Sam V. Richardson, and Bozen right through his fingers. I mean, none of the guys backing Bibbs up have a catch all year. So it's third down and goal from the 12-yard line. Richardson underneath. Oh, a big hit on Jarvis West. He got laid out by Mallet. He got to go, right? Or are you going to take points? Iowa State's going to take points. Fourth and seven or eight. That false start, or excuse me, that delay of game penalty really killed Iowa State there. Yeah, Richardson had an opportunity there. Third down. Watch the middle of the field. They're going to run tight end right down the middle. If he pulls the trigger there, he just came into the screen, that would have been a touchdown. Missed opportunity. Cole Netton only attempted 13 field goals this year. A 26-yard try to get Iowa State some points, and the Cyclones are on the board. Certainly they're disappointed, though. First down and goal at the five, and they go backwards via penalty and a negative play, and then a drop by... Bozen in the end zone. 14-3, TCU. Well, we know Oregon's in. Is TCU in? They here, Fingal. I feel like they're going to win with some style and extend their journey. So does Brian Greasy. And we saw style on the first touchdown by TCU. A throwback to the quarterback, Trevon Boykin, for his first career receiving touchdown. And it's 14-3, Horn Frogs. We are less than 24 hours away from... The rankings being revealed and the four teams that will be in the inaugural college football playoff. Tejada will take a knee and will come out to the 25. It's amazing that TCU is even back in the playoff conversation after a 4-8 and eight season last year. Some coaching changes on the offensive side of the ball and they sit at 10-1, and 7-1 in the Big 12. Under Sonny Cumbie and Doug Meacham, greatly improved offense. Third in the country in scoring, fifth in total offense. And their defense has been excellent this year, holding five opponents under 14 points. Four times under Gary Patterson, they've been the FBS leader in total defense. They recruit well here. They won a Rose Bowl with a lot of guys who are in the NFL, including their quarterback, Andy Dalton. And they've got a 14-3 lead here early in the second quarter. And Boykin! As a 
Completion to Josh Doxson to the 42-yard line, so an easy pitch and catch for 17 yards. And the most amazing thing of that whole turnaround is people don't realize how bad it was last year. They were 2-7 and seven in the conference, and their two wins were against Kansas and Iowa State. And they had to come back in last-second fashion against this Iowa State team last year. On the road, Teron Boykin had to score late. But it, it, it has really been a complete 180 for this TCU team this year. Desmond White is in the game here. They're going to call timeout. They had Boykin lined up wide to the left. He wasn't sure exactly what he was supposed to do or where exactly to line up. They had White, a true freshman, in as the Wildcat quarterback, but they had to burn a timeout. Welcome back. I think TCU only had 10 guys on the field, five offensive linemen. You got one, two, three, four. That's 10 guys. You see on the bottom, there is... Doug Meacham calling a timeout. You know, Brian, that could be why Boykin had his arms up. Maybe it wasn't because he was lined up incorrectly. He was wondering where the 11th guy was. Maybe he was supposed to be down next to him. Well, he was right over there in front of Doug Meacham, and Meacham, I'm sure, was screaming to get one more guy on the field. There you go. He's trying to come off the field. They were trying. They were, yeah, they were trying to. They were trying to trick him. I think they were trying to trick him and get Boykin left out there by himself, and uh, it worked except they didn't have enough guys on the field. TCU averaging 11 yards per first down. Here's a screen to Aaron Green. In trouble and brought down for a loss. Jared Brackens makes the play at the 37-yard line. That's a five-yard loss. You know, these are one of the, one of the things that uh, TCU loves is these screens, and you get guys rushing upfield, and it's just really well diagnosed. You split those two offensive linemen and get the back on the ground. It's well done. Iowa State showing like it's going to blitz here on second down and 15. Here come the Cyclones, and there is contact. No penalty flag, though. Ty Slanita, the intended receiver, and the officials felt that Kamari Cotton Moya arrived at the time of the football, so no foul. Yeah, this is the zero pressure. Cotton Moya reads it. One of the adjustments is that inside slant. Looked like he got there a little bit early. Defenses know when they bring pressure, that ball has to come out fast, and that's why Cotton Moya has the ability to jump that route. Now it's third down and 15. Only the third, third down for TCU here in the first half. And Boykin finds Doxson, tackled short of the first down at the 49, so it's fourth down and three. We'll see if the Horn Frogs go for it. No, they're going to punt. You surprised? Yeah. I am surprised with the way this offense has performed in this game and really all year. And Doug Meacham is really hot on the sideline. He knew that he had that play to Boykin set up, and then you come out and you got to punt the ball. That will not make him happy. Here's West, and the fair catch made at the 11 yard line. 11 10 remaining in the second quarter. It's 14 3, TCU. One of the great frogs of all time, LaDainian Tomlinson finished fourth in the Heisman race in 2000. That's where Trevon Boykin might finish. Boykin's coach isn't real happy right now, Doug Meacham. Yeah, look at him taking a deep breath there. You know, I, I really like this. He, he was upset. He was angry. Didn't come off the way he wanted it, but what did he do? Before he goes over and talks to his players, he takes a deep breath and composes himself and goes over and has a calm conversation. That's, that's growing as a coach. And, and now you see him over there all by himself. You know, he's a, he is a, he's a different character. He is an innovative, but a very free thinker of offensive football. And I think you're seeing some growth from, from Doug Meacham this season for TCU. Iowa State will run Wimberley on first down. And there's a hole up to the 20. Wimberley finally tackled at the 25. It's a 14-yard run. You know, guys, initially on the sideline for TCU, what they were upset about, what Coach Meacham was upset about, is each coach, Curtis Looper, the running back coach, and the receivers coach, Randy Burns, they're in charge of personnel and making sure the right people are on and off the field. That's what he was initially upset about. And this thing's become such a well-oiled machine that when you have a hiccup, it becomes magnified. Hopefully they'll get it ironed out here shortly. Well, Iowa State starting to run the ball on TCU, back-to-back. Solid pickups by Wimberley. That was a six-yard gain. Again, if Iowa State were to come down and score, even if it's a field goal, at least the Cyclones could feel like they're in the game here. Puts pressure on TCU. You wonder how 
that might impact that Horn Frog sideline. Well, they've got to run the football. We've talked with Mark Mangino this week. You know, they can't put all the pressure on Sam Richardson, but the problem is this offense, they have not been able to rush the football consistently this year at all. They're 105th in the country running the football, and with Bibbs out, their best receiver, they've got to get some production in that running game. Richardson, and that was dropped at the 35-yard line by Jarvis West. Would have been a first down. Instead, it's third down and four. Iowa State has been pretty good on third down coming into today. Third of the Big 12 at 45%, but so far just one of five. We haven't really called Jarvis West's number in this game. He's in the slot. Number one in third down situations, he is an option. See if TCU pressures Richardson here. Offensive line has given him good protection. That pass in traffic is broken up by Sam Carter. Again intended for West. That's fourth down. And will Iowa State? Yep, Iowa State get a punt. Well, there's nowhere. They're trying to get the ball to West just over the first down marker. And Carter jumps it. That's Mallet, the linebackers on the inside. That's just great defense from TCU. Until you show a defense that you can go over the top, they are going to jump on those kinds of routes. And Iowa State has not been able to back off Sam Carter. But they do flip the field. They were backed up around their 10-yard line. And now with a good punt by Downing, TCU will have possession inside the 20-yard line. Around the 18 as Echols Looper Elected not to signal for a fair catch, and he was dropped immediately at the 20-yard line. 48-yard punt. No return. Matthew Thomas, the gunner, made the play for Iowa State. Penalty marker down in the middle of the field around the 45-yard line. During the kick, illegal block in the back, number 84 receiving team. 10 yards from the end of the kick, first down timeout. So that'll back up TCU to its 10-yard line. It's 14-3, 9.50 remaining. Pretty easy call for the official. TCU backed up when we return. Today's AFLAC trivia question, no peeking greasy. Who is the only TCU player to score a touchdown for and against TCU? Oof. From the uh, is it Big, 12, Big 12 days or Mountain West? I'll give you a hint, he's on the roster. Oh, he's on the roster. Uh, boy, throwing a blank. He's on the field. There's even a bigger hit. First down for TCU on its 10-yard line. And Boykin hits Dotson at the 25-yard line. A huge cushion given by the defensive back. And Josh Doxson, transfer from he Wyoming. Just gets the ball out there at the 40 say. yard line. <laughs> I'm going to say Josh Doxson. <laughs> I was just looking out there saying, well, I know Doxson transferred from Wyoming. <laughs> and what a pickup he has been. He has been nothing short of remarkable this season. Penalty marker down. Might have been offside on Iowa State. Boykin runs for about four yards. I'll tell you what, Doxon knows uh, a great cue when he gets one, right? You can put an Affleck trivia question up, and then he makes a play. Well, TCU is backing up. Illegal formation, offense. More than four in the offensive backfield. Five-yard penalty, first down. So Josh Doxon played... Against TCU in 2011, at three catches and a touchdown. TCU beat Wyoming. Our AFLAC trivia question. And obviously, he's had a terrific uh, junior season with eight touchdown catches now as a member of the Horned Frogs. We even have some video to support our AFLAC trivia answer this week, Brian. That's well, just great production there. And Boykin going to air it out. Listen, he's got to stop. And he makes the grab inside the 20-yard line. Beautiful deep ball thrown by Trevon Boykin. Time and time again, it's been the speed of Lissenby downfield and the accuracy from Trevon Boykin. That's his 37th catch on the year. How many times have we seen that this year? It's just time and time again. Very well executed.
So now in the red zone, listen B, out in the flat, slips a tackle, and he's wrapped up, wrestled to the ground at the 10-yard line by Cotton Moya. That's a seven-yard game. I thought it was interesting talking with Gary Patterson. As you see, listen B gets up. He's a little shaky on the sideline there. He is, uh, he does not look right. He either hit his head on the ground or something happened on the side. Let's take another look. Fighting for some extra yardage. Oh, we oh, yeah. see that. We see that a number of times when the side of the head comes down on the ground. That's dangerous. They've already lost B.J. Catalan with a head injury, although Gary Patterson told us he could be back for their bowl game. In trouble. And down at the 25-yard line is Hicks. So a huge loss of about 12 yards as Jared Brackens makes the stop in the TCU backfield. Hey, guys, I was standing here on the sideline literally less than a yard from where Lissenby went down. He went down hard, helmet to the turf. Actually got a good look at his eyes, and when he got up, uh, you could tell that maybe not all of his dogs were barking. He went over to the sideline, and they are, they are very seriously attending to him right now. That would be a big loss. He's a deep threat, track star, All-American at TCU. Boykin, he's going to throw it to the end zone, and a diving attempt, but incomplete. Doxon couldn't catch up to the pass, and so it's fourth down, and that's uh, that's a win for Iowa State. Holds a TCU to a field goal try. And you don't see Trevon Boykin miss very often. Doxon wide open, and if that ball's in play, it's a touchdown. But I think TCU fans are a little more concerned about the health of Colby Lissenby. He's been such a big factor in taking pressure off of Josh Doxon. Between Doxon, Lissenby, and Deontay Gray, they really complement each other, and they force defenses to play honest. 39-yard attempt, and Oberchrome nails it. It's an excellent kicker. 21 of 25 now on the year. Tomorrow, the selection committee's final rankings will be revealed at 12.30 Eastern time, about 23 hours from now on ESPN. Find out who's in on the college football playoff selection show presented by AT&T. Oregon is in. I think you can say that with certainty after last night. You've got Alabama. They're the only ones that are guaranteed. The only ones. For now, yep. TCU wins. Maybe the Horned Frogs will be in. And a lot of people thought maybe if Alabama lost, even, that they would have a chance to get I don't. I do not agree with that. You don't win your championship and you have two losses, you will not be in. Here's Aaron Wimberly on the return for Iowa State. Down 14 points here. Wimberly dropped at the 21-yard line. TCU 10-1. They were fifth last week. They jumped Florida State. Remember, this team was picked seventh in their conference preseason. Since the loss to Baylor, they have won six in a row. Now, they won at West Virginia on a last-second field goal back on November 1st, 31-30. They barely escaped Lawrence with a 34-30 win. They knocked off Oklahoma by four, but then they hammered Kansas State and the win at Texas last yeah. Thursday. I think it was a big exclamation point for the committee when they beat the Longhorns 48-10 on the road. Yeah, and in between those two games was their only, you know, real questionable game, which was against Kansas. They won by four on the road and didn't look great doing it. But certainly that win at Texas, coupled with what Baylor did in Texas Tech, helped them. Wimberly dropped for a loss of about three or four. But here, here's a question everybody has. Why, when you've lost a head-to-head -to, -head to a team in your own conference, are you still ahead of them? And actually, this week, increase their distance from Baylor, moving from two spots ahead to three slots ahead. Yeah, and I think uh, there's a lot of factors going into this, and I think when you listen to Jeff Long, the chair of the committee, uh, they are not comparing their complete body of work at this point. The game that Baylor has against Kansas State is necessary for the committee to compare apples to apples with TCU and Baylor. Pass off target by Richardson brings up third down and 14. And a lot of us, really everybody, has been waiting, thinking that this would happen. The head-to-head -head would come into play after the complete body of work is in play and the, the season of the conference champions have been uh, ironed out. Those two factors really is what the committee has been waiting on now, although three to six is a much different deal than we, we had even two weeks ago. Right, I wonder if the conversation anymore is about Baylor versus TCU, or if it's Baylor, Florida State, Baylor, Ohio. Ohio State, if TCU wins this game, wins it handily. Third and 14, Richardson in trouble, and gets rid of it at the last second. There was a receiver in the area, so no grounding. Davion Pearson had the pressure, it's fourth down. 
And this TCU defense, I think, is what a lot of what the committee, what people around college football are starting to see that this defense is playing better. And under Gary Patterson, and especially in that back seven, uh, they got after Texas. They're certainly, and we know Texas is not the greatest offense, but they were getting better with Tyrone Swoops, and they complete go in and completely dominate that team, score on defense the way they did. Uh, that opened some eyes as well. Texas had won three in a row prior to that Thursday night defeat. Fair catch made at the 37-yard line, so a good starting field position here for TCU. This is what I. This is how I look at it. But these are the games that, when you look at Baylor and you look at TCU and you look at common opponents that that matter. West Virginia, you see what happened. Baylor obviously lost a close game. Kansas, Texas Tech, Oklahoma. You look at all of those, and and to me, you know, there's there's a check mark on the side of TCU until this Kansas State game happens, right? Whatever happens yep. in that game, 21 points, TCU beat Kansas State. What does Baylor do? And then when that's done. You look at these two teams against each other, and if they're still common, there's still not a whole lot of difference. To me, it's Baylor from the head-to-head. -head. Boykin on first down. Great throw. Catch made by Gray to the 41. There's a penalty flag thrown in. But remember, the committee is supposed to pick the four best teams, so it's not just head-to-head. -head. They, they've got to look at everything, and they've got to look at what they see. I mean, you've got former football coaches, and they're watching tape, making a decision. Obviously, they feel Pass that TCU is better than Number Baylor. Number one, offense, 15-yard penalty, first down. If they thought, thought that Baylor was better than TCU, they'd have them ahead of them. In their eyes, I don't think the head, the head it, it, it matters at all. I, I think they look and see that TCU is a better football team in their mind, even though they lost. Had a 21-point lead with 11 minutes left. Obviously, they watched the end of that game. They feel TCU is a better team. But, but Dave, it, it doesn't matter what they think right now. It matters what they think after Kansas State and Baylor play tonight. Okay, that's the difference. Yeah. I mean, we, we want to have it all answered today. Uh, it's going to be answered after that game tonight. Here's Gray, and good job keeping his balance. Finally ripped out of the 29-yard line. So a gain of seven there on first and 25. Mitchell Myers on the stop. Opportunity here for TCU. Just before the half, six minutes to get more points. Out of the backfield is Aaron Green, and he gets tagged. Sandwiched at the 28-yard line, might have lost a yard. Sam E. Richardson was in there for Iowa State, along with Darian Cotton. And Doug Meacham has kept Colby Lissenby on the sideline. I don't think that we're going to see him anywhere anytime soon back in this football game but TCU has plenty of options on the outside third down to 19 Boykin throws underneath and it's knocked away would not have been a first down anyway Iowa State had a couple safeties about 30 yards off the line of scrimmage so fourth down and again if Iowa State can just get points here before <laughs> halftime I know we've said it three or four <laughs> you times. You said the last three drives. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you said if they could get points, they would take them. <laughs> <laughs> At TCU, again, you said they had to make a statement. Has this been a statement so far? Well, they haven't played their best football. I mean, we've seen some miscommunications. We've seen some drop balls, but they're up 17 to three, up two touchdowns. It's not terrible. Jarvis West had a little trouble getting a handle. Didn't want to muff the punt. 47-yard kick, no return. Here are the AT&T College Football Playoff Rankings. Alabama, Missouri in the SEC Championship. Florida State, Georgia Tech. Dr. Pepper ACC Championship. Ohio State, Wisconsin, Big Ten title game. And then, of course, last night, Oregon throttled Arizona to lock up a spot in the playoff. Huge day in college football. I mean, a, really a historic day in college football with what's going to happen today. Such great matchups. There's going to be all kinds of movement. I, I'm not discounting the, the fact that there's probably going to be some upsets. I mean, Florida State, in my opinion, is on upset alert, big time upset alert against the tough Georgia Tech team. And what would that do to the rankings? Richardson in trouble, and down he goes, back at the 20. Sacked by Terrell Lathan, Chucky Hunter. In there for TCU as well. Brian, do you think there's any chance if Florida State wins, but it's a win similar to what they've done the last month and a half? 
that even as an undefeated team, they don't get in? No, I don't think so. I think the, the committee's been pretty clear. The floor has been set for Florida State. If they win, no matter how they win against Georgia Tech, they will be the number four team. And, and I agree with the committee and where Florida State is. I think they should have been at four for a couple of weeks now. Richardson, a dangerous pass, tried to hit West, and Marcus Mallett, the linebacker, thought he should have had a pick. Instead, it's third down and 15. Two possession game, five minutes to go here in the second quarter. If TCU wins, it will share Big 12 championship with either Baylor or Kansas State. Again, no Big 12 championship game. Which they need to fix, by the way. They need to have a championship game in the Big 12. We have to compare apples to apples with the Big 5 conferences. I don't care that they have 10 teams. Even if you want to just have 5 and 5, play a championship game, please. Richardson on third down and long. Throw it to the Iowa State bench. It's fourth down. And so another punt for Iowa State. And you know what? The commissioners probably get together in the offseason. You know, you look at Jim Delaney, John Swafford from the ACC. They're going to get together, Bob Bowlesby, and say, look, you guys need to play a championship game. And especially, Dave, if Florida State loses and, and Baylor wins, yeah. and you have Baylor and you have TCU in the top four at the end of the day, you think that there won't be crime from the Big Ten, ACC, Pac-12, all of them. So Gary Patterson having an intense conversation with Paul Dawson upset about something on the last defensive series. A dangerous play, it's Muff, and Iowa State's got it. Why on earth would Eccles Luber try to field that? He muffs it, and Iowa State takes over inside the TCU 40-yard line. Josh Jollis with the recovery, and Eccles Looper shaking up. And why, why try that? There's no reason. He's just trying. To, that ball was coming hot, and I know he's trying to save 10 or 15 more yards, that ball going downfield. Not only does he muff this punt and give Iowa State an opportunity, but then he gets hurt. He gets crumpled up here, and he's still down on the field. That was Jared Brackens who came in with a big hit. And they've already lost Colby Lissenby, and now Eccles Looper, who's a good receiver, and their return man is banged up. 4.47 left. Iowa State with a chance to get it to a one-possession game. Well, he's an important piece of their offense as well. He's, he's very uh, creative. He's, he can, he's a former quarterback. He was a backup quarterback. Lissenby already on the sideline. But what Eccles Looper brings to the offense is when they throw those screens, he's the one that's typically throwing the ball back and throw it back to the quarterback. He can throw it downfield. He's had some touchdowns. He is an important part of that offense. Well, coming up on the Capital One Halftime Report, John Saunders and company will get you caught up on all the day's college football action. Have a couple games going on on ESPN and ESPN2. And, of course, later today, all the championship games, SEC, Big Ten, ACC, and Baylor, Kansas State tonight. Again, with these injuries for you know, TCU, this is something the committee is supposed to consider. We saw JT Barrett go down the Michigan-Ohio State game. Obviously, that is part of the criteria that the committee will use to select its four teams to play in the college football playoff. You have Listen B and Echoes Looper. B.J. Catalan has been banged up. He might not be back uh, for the uh, playoff game. Obviously, the committee will consider that. Key injuries are part of the criteria. Now, I, don't, I don't think that uh, head injuries, concussions, those kinds of things uh, have any impact when you have a three-week, three-and-a-half-week break before they would play these, these semifinal games. So those won't factor into the committee's decision. But certainly, those injuries, the... Uh, Knees, ankles, those kinds of things like what we saw with JT Barrett have a, have a big factor. Last eight plays for Iowa State, zero or negative yards. They have the ball at the TCU 39. And they're going to throw it back to West. And he's going to throw it downfield. It's underthrown. And it is intercepted. Tejada picked it off. He took it away from Ted Ekby. That's a bad throw by West. He does have a touchdown pass this year, and Ekby was open. A great play call after the turnover. Here he is down here. Ekby's just going to run down, and you're going to see West comes out. He's got a great opportunity. You throw it back behind the line of scrimmage. You just got to get that ball downfield. It's wide open. If that ball is put in the purple downfield, it's a touchdown. Instead, it's the first interception of the season for Richard freshman Anthony Tejada. A big momentum shift. 
The first play after a takeaway by Iowa State on special teams. TCU gets it back now looking to try to get more points before halftime. Long throw to David Porter. And Porter has the first down to the 21-yard line. And R Anthony Tejada, that's a big that's a big confidence boost for him personally. You know, he's he's that new guy in the back end, the redshirt freshman. He went up perfectly. He saw he put his hand right between the receiver's two hands and ripped that ball out. Now he's had a rough go in the Baylor game. He was picked on quite a bit. Antoine Goodley can pick on a lot of people, but Tejada's a guy that they're going to need as this season goes on. Another lateral throw to Kyle Hicks. Seeing a lot of passes, the swing passes out on the flat. Hicks out to the 37-yard line. They get 16 more yards there. Two timeouts remaining, four minutes to go. TC looking ahead to its 14-point lead. Hicks is a guy that's really impressive. When I watch the film, they, you know, he's kind of had a bigger role since B.J. Catalan went out of that West Virginia game. And not just run the football, Dave. He's a great receiver out of the backfield. They'll line him up in the slot. They'll throw the ball 15, 20 yards downfield to him. Here's a quarterback run. Boykin across the 40 and crunched at the 41, a four-yard pickup. You know, we talked with Gary Patterson, guys, and he, and he mentioned a three- to five-year plan as they transition into the Big 12. Well, Kyle Hicks is a prime example of that transition. He was originally committed to Texas. He was a under-the-radar yet somewhat high-profile guy in the minds of TCU, realizing he could be a load back for them. I think in the future, he is the guy that will carry the load in the run game. He's got an opportunity to be a difference maker in this offense. Boykin to throw on second and six, and a completion to Doxon into Iowa State territory. Steps out at the 41-yard line. And not much resistance right now by Iowa State's pass defense, an 18-yard game. Great combination route here. You clear out, you're just putting Dotson on the curl route, right around the flat defender. Curl flat uh, concept has been around longer than you or I have been watching football. And <laughs> if you're going to play zone coverage, that's the one they're going to dial up. Green spun down at the 35, but that offensive line for TCU is leaning on Iowa State. I won't force you to pronounce the names of the tackles. I'll do it for you, Go but ahead. two pretty good ones. Tayo Fabuluje and Halapuli Vati Faitai, the left and right tackles respectively. Wow. And I went to Syracuse. <laughs> Second and four, two and a half remaining. Green straight ahead, first down and more. Inside the 20. Down at the 19, 16 yard run. Well, we talk about Hicks and Aaron Green gets jealous. Take a look at this cut, real speed. Oh, that is wicked right there. There's a lot of talent in this backfield. You talk about B.J. Catalan is that home run guy. He's a 4-3-4-4 guy and they don't have another back like that. But these guys, Aaron Green and Hicks, more than capable. Two minutes remaining. TCU in scoring position. Green gets to about the 17-yard line. Green played a big part, Dave, last year in the comeback win in Ames against this Iowa State team. Had 72 yards on 19 carries. Transferred from Nebraska. He's finally getting his opportunity in a two-back system with B.J. Catalan, and now he's the, the featured guy in this TCU offense. You mentioned the game in Ames last year. Two years ago here in Fort Worth, TCU lost that game. It was its first Big 12 home game and lost to Iowa State. And the Horned Frogs seeking their first Big 12 championship. Tonight on ABC, it's the Dr. Pepper ACC championship game. Georgia Tech and Florida State, the Yellow Jackets, very good at taking the ball away from you. Jameis Winston has made a lot of mistakes lately. Will this finally be the breakout game here in 2014 for a Florida State offense? It hasn't looked very good, especially compared to last year. It's at 8 Eastern tonight. The answer is no. You think Georgia Tech's going <laughs> to win? I think Georgia shut Tech. Paul Johnson has that team playing outstanding football. You beat Clemson and Georgia. Georgia's an outstanding team. That all that defense for Florida State, they got a lot of players, right? A lot of names, a lot of guys on the on the edge, Chris Casher and guys like that. Mario Edwards. They don't block them in the option. They just run that option. And if you are not fundamentally sound and disciplined on defense with your eyes, which Florida State has not been able to prove on a consistent basis, then you're gonna be in trouble. 
And Justin Thomas throwing the football. I understand DeAndre Smelter is not going to play in his game. They're number one receiver, but but this offense for Paul Johnson is legit. Well, we had them early in the year when they were still trying to figure out what they were defensively. Yeah. And Ted Roof at the time, as he often is when we talk to him, he, he was unsure yeah. uh, of his defense. But obviously, they played well. They've gotten better. But again, at some point, you have to think that Winston's going to protect the ball better, and that offense is going to come alive and score a lot of points. I think Florida State wins tonight. You know, I. Jameis Winston's playing the worst football of his career. Yeah. You don't just turn that around overnight. And I understand, you know, in the first half versus the second half, if they don't play well in the first half, they get down four, 10, 14 points, they may not get enough possessions in the second half of that game to come back. When Georgia Tech played Miami, Miami only had three possessions in the second half, and that was a big reason why Georgia Tech beat them. And so if you're Florida State and Jimbo Fisher, you can't depend on being able to come back in the second half. Boykin. And a run with everybody covered and sacked at the 19-yard line. See if they. Call guys, the when you think here. about that, you think about that ACC championship game. When you look at the hidden numbers behind Georgia Tech, Greece, you talk about not having enough possessions to come from behind if you needed to. But if you look at Georgia Tech, what they've done is they've capitalized on other teams' turnovers with touchdowns. It's not just getting the ball and then having a series, kicking a field goal, or having to punt it away. They've gotten points out of it, and Florida State cannot afford to get behind on that. Big third and ten here, Tom, for TCU and Iowa State bringing pressure. Here's a fade, and it is intercepted in the end zone. Sam E. Richardson with his fourth pick. He played that beautifully. First on the receiver, Emmanuel Porter, and then to play the ball and get the pick, and that keeps TCU from extending its lead. Take a look at his jam. Jam is so critical when you're playing man-to-man -man coverage. He does not allow Emmanuel Porter to get beyond him. He gets into his chest. Emmanuel Porter is a true freshman. He's six foot four, and what that tells Sam Richardson is got a big target on his chest. And in man-to-man -man coverage, he's going to come off and jam him. And then when that ball is released, because Trevon Boykin's got to throw it, Richardson just reacts to it. Well, Grapevine, Texas is only 25 miles away. That's where the uh, selection committee is meeting, and you know they're watching. We'll see if there's some reevaluating being done at halftime. TCU has made some mistakes in this game. They've lost a couple players to injury. Meanwhile, Iowa State has scored as many points as the Horned Frogs here in the second quarter. Both teams with three here in the second period. Wimberley, as Iowa State's being conservative here with 40 seconds left. Boy, if I'm if I'm Gary Patterson, I take my two timeouts here, and maybe I could force force. Uh, I agree. Why not? Iowa State, yeah, every snap they take is an opportunity maybe to get a turnover. But he seems content to uh, let Iowa State win one more conservative play. There's about a second difference between game and play clocks, and they'll hand it off. And the tackle made at the 24 by Mallett. And again, he called timeout here, forced him to run a play in third down, and they punt on fourth, but nope, that's it. That's the end of the first half. TCU ranked third by the College Football Playoff Committee. It wasn't unimpressive, but a lot of people thought this would be over at halftime, given that Iowa State is 2-9 and 0-8 and and in conference play. And 343 yards of offense for TCU, but only 17 points. And seven of those came in a trick play. Yeah. And I think you'll see in the second half, Gary Patterson, I think they'll probably ramp it up. They had some miscommunication on the offensive side. You know, Doug Meacham probably not happy. It'll be a spirited locker room for TCU. Baylor, Kansas State tonight on ESPN. TCU leading at halftime. And as you see, Gary Patterson is with Lou. Well, Coach, you guys have made your fair share of plays on defense in the secondary. Struggled to stop the run a little bit from Iowa State. What are the tweaks in the second half defensively? Well, for us, we just got to tackle. We went third and 14, and they ran the ball, and we were in a nickel. And you got to tackle, and you got to keep doing what you're doing. They try to trick play. Really, the only thing I see is we got to quit hurting ourselves on offense with penalties. Can't turn the ball over. You can't be in first and 25. You're not going to be very good when you do that. Now, what are they doing defensively from your perspective on offense that's created maybe a little bit of indecisiveness? Well, I think the big, I don't know if they're saying that. They're just doing a nice job. Iowa State always plays us tough. They do the things. You know, we've had our plays deep. 
We beat them, but they sit on routes, and they always play the run hard. All right, thank you, Coach. You bet. Gary Patterson and TCU leading 17-3 at the half here in Fort Worth. Coming up after the break, it's the Capital One Halftime Report. Welcome back to ESPN on ABC College Football, presented by Cade Jewelers. TCU leads at the half, 17-3. So 30 minutes away from at least a share of the Big 12 championship and perhaps a spot in the college football playoff. Dave Pash, Brian Greasy, Tom Luganville here in Fort Worth. All right, you've watched TCU all season on film. Now you get to see him in person. What would you think? Nah. <laughs> I mean, I think really? if you're Gary Patterson at halftime, you go in and you tell your guys, this, we have to put our foot on the gas pedal. I know Trevon Boykin, 20 to 27. They have 300 yards passing in the first half. They only have 17 points. I think they need to come out and have a statement in the second half. All right. Well, they did have a couple turnovers there in that first half. Let's take a look at our good hands play brought to you by Allstate. The uh, trick play for the first score for TCU, the throwback to Boykin, the former receiver, but it's his first career receiving touchdown. David Porter on the pass. And Boykin, Brian, was excellent in that first half. And reading defenses, obviously this was zero pressure. They adjust, they get docks, and that leads to an Eric Green touchdown. And then on defense, Tejada makes the interception to stall one Iowa State drive. And then this was a, this was Emmanuel Porter, the true freshman wide receiver. You got to go up and get that ball. You can't allow Richardson the corner just to to play fair catch under that. Those two turnovers really, I think, is what kind of stalled TCU from getting more points on the board. And for what it's worth, Iowa State had more rushing yards than TCU. We saw a couple big runs by the Cyclones, but they were unable to sustain any drives. 17-3, Iowa State has yet to win a Big 12 game this year. TCU 10-1, tied at 7-1 atop the Big 12 with Baylor and Kansas State. That game tonight on ESPN. And deep kickoff by Iowa State. Tejada takes a knee, so it will come out to the 25. Our Pacific Life game summary. 300 passing yards for Boykin. In the first half, he's now over 3,500, a TCU record. Meanwhile, Doxon had a big half, as did Lissenby. Lissenby, though, was injured and not expected to return. Iowa State struggled on third down, normally pretty good on third down. And then this was a big turnover here down 17-3. The backwards pass to West, and then his pass downfield underthrown to a wide open Tad Ekby. And the interception keeps it at a two-score game. And Boykin on the keeper, breaks a tackle, makes everybody miss, ducks under a player, and gets the first down to the 40-yard line. 15 yards, checking with Tom Luganville. Well, guys, Brian, you talked about being able to put your foot on the pedal. I think that's a sign of maturity. One of the most difficult things to do in coaching is to get your team prepared to play a game and beat an opponent they're supposed to beat. You can't hide it. You put it on film. Your players know who you are and who they are. you got to perform, and it's a sign of maturity when you finish the game. Now, well, making plays like that, Tom. Now, pass over the middle, a little behind David Porter, but drop the ball there in midfield. Definitely catchable, second down. Well, they're going to need their receivers to step up and start making plays more consistent. Here's Doxo and over 100 receiving yards in the first half. He's forward to the 46 for seven yards. It'll bring up third down and three. Yeah, and Doxon is the one that you don't have to worry about. You know what you're going to get from him. Solid production every single time he takes the field. But with Listen B out, who's going to be the guy that steps up on the outside, Emmanuel Porter, the true freshman. Deontay Gray, we haven't called his name a whole lot. He hasn't played the last couple of weeks because of an injury. So he's trying to get back into the flow, but we haven't called his name a whole lot today either. TCU wasn't much better on third down of the first half. And wide open, though, is Aaron Green down the sideline. And Green taking off. Cuts it back. Into the end zone. Touchdown, TCU. 54 yards. Foot, meet, gas pedal. <laughs> I mean, you come out and make a statement on offense. Perfectly thrown football. 
from Trevon Boyk and Nigel Tribune in the corner who's responsible in zone coverage for staying outside and having leverage. Paul Rhodes knows you got to keep leverage when the back comes out of the backfield. The ball is thrown perfectly. Tribune takes the wrong angle and green speed to the end zone. That's two touchdowns for Aaron Green, now nine in the year. And maybe this game playing out like Oregon's game with Arizona last week, or last night, where it was a game in which Oregon missed some opportunities early, started to score touchdowns, and before you knew it, it was a blowout. Well, that happened here in Fort Worth. A big play for Aaron Green, a touchdown run after the catch to make it 24-3. Coming Sunday, January 4th at 8, 7 Central, it's Gallivan, a four-week comedy extravaganza featuring guest stars John Stamos, Rutger Hauer, and Ricky Gervais. This is one you can miss. Gallivan starts Sunday, January 4th. Well, Trevon Boykin, has tied Andy Dalton with 27 touchdown passes. That's the single season school record. And Boykin now almost 3,600 passing yards. And it's also a school record. And TCU has stretched its lead to 21. Ryan Benucci kicking off. And this will be a touchback. And it will come out to the 25 for Iowa State back and take a look at the touchdown you're going to see Nigel Tribune he's right here and he's he's responsible man-to-man -man coverage he's going to get caught inside and what happens is when the back comes out there's nobody left Tribune is supposed to have outside leverage in a zone concept and he allows Green to get to the outside now great job by Trevon Boykin take a look at his eyes in his head from the pocket Watch his eyes go out to the flat before his head turns. Why that's important, you see the eyes go right there? His eyes going one way, but his head's going the same way. It's because defensive backs only see the helmet. They don't see the eyes, and you can keep a defender inside with the helmet while your eyes are looking to the outside. It's a great close-up look from our crew on how quarterbacks can use their eyes to influence coverage. Iowa State had success running the ball in the first half. They try Aaron Wimberly here on first and 10, and he gets maybe two to the 27-yard line. And TCU comes into this game, number three in the college football playoff. They were picked seventh, pick 12 in the preseason, and they were unranked in the AP and USA Today polls until late September. One of the reasons why the... Uh, College Football Playoff Selection Committee wanted to wait until late October to start its rankings. Well, guys, over here on the Iowa State sideline, Coach Paul Rhodes telling his offense to respond. Manageable down and distance, guys. That's what he wants. Let's see what you're made of. Things aren't going your way. Do you have an answer? And can you respond and keep the ball away from TCU right now? Well, you got to get in third and manageable time. They've been in third and long a lot. That's a big reason why they're one of eight on third down today. Richardson is hit, and down he goes again to the 22-yard line. Chucky Hunter with the sack on Richardson. Chucky Hunter, he's just a scrapper on the inside. He's not, not the fastest, not the strongest, not certainly not the biggest, but he's played a lot of football here for TCU, and you can depend on him. Doesn't miss a whole lot of games. Solid player on the inside. Cameron Eccles, Luber, who is a uh, looper who was shaken up in the first half, is back out there to return a punt. He was injured trying to field a punt that he shouldn't have, ended up turning it over. Meanwhile, Cam uh, may have a, a roughing the kicker penalty here, which would give first down to Iowa State. Personal foul, roughing the kicker, number 35 defense, 15 yard penalty. Automatic first down. It's on Sammy Douglas, you heard Gary Patterson tell Tom Luganbill at the half, we got to cut down on our penalties, and that's a big one. Yeah, you come out, you get a touchdown on your first drive, and just trying to get that ball with his hand, and mm. that's dangerous for a kicker. You you got to protect the kicker. I mean, I yeah, you hit that plant foot, it's going to be an yeah. automatic 15-yard yeah. penalty. I mean, that's broken ankle, you know, ACL kind of stuff there, rolling into the kicker like that. It's a good call. Only the fourth first down for Iowa State today comes via penalty, but they'll take whatever they can get down 21 points. Have a little breathing room now at their 38-yard line. And they've got to establish that run game. Again, without their best player, E.J. Bibbs, at the tight end spot, and DeVario Montgomery, their best wide receiver we haven't seen yet in the second half, they've got to get Wimberly going.
Everybody covered, and including the intended receiver. Richardson tried to hit Ben Bozen, who dropped the touchdown in the first half. Paul Dawson was in coverage. You know, and I'm not quite sure why Mark Mangino has, has been targeting Bozen uh, a lot in this game. Obviously, they tried to throw that touchdown past him. He dropped it a couple of times in the first half. They tried to get the football to him. He's not, he's not a... He's not your best option. He's he's a backup tight end that's really a blocker, and he's tough. He's a former walk-on, but throw the ball to your players on the outside. Jarvis West, Lazard, some of those guys, they can make plays for you. And Montgomery has been in and out of the lineup today with an injury. Here's a good run by Wimberley on second down and 10. He got about a handful before Dawson, the leading tackler on this TCU team, rips him down. The big third down here, you wonder if Iowa State's getting near four down territory, even though the ball is still on their side of the field. Fine Lazard, number five, he's matched up on Tejada down at the bottom of the screen. There he is. Just one catch, four yards for Lazard, who came in their leading pass catcher from the receiver position. That pass is broken up again by Tejada, intended for Lazard. So it's fourth down, and Iowa State will punt. And great read by Tejada. He just backpedals. He did a backpedal. Not a great route by Lazard. You, you want to talk about the importance of the details at the wide receiver position. If you just come off the ball and don't give him any kind of stem or don't threaten a corner to the outside and think you're going to run, run in there on a slant and catch the ball, you got another thing coming. you got to have the details, and, to, and Lazard, as a true freshman, even though he's big at 6'5", if you don't have the details, Tejada's going to read it and break it up. Yeah, you got to win that one, help your quarterback out. As uh, the right guard for Iowa State, Daniel Burton is shaken up. Injuries have been a huge problem all season long for the Cyclones. As Burton will try to fight through injury, play this final game for Iowa State this year. Paul Rhodes in a sixth season, 2-15 in conference play the last two years. And remember, this was an Iowa State team that went to bowl games three of the first four years. Got up to a decent start this year, played Kansas State tough, beat Iowa. Well, decent start other than the first game. They lost to North Dakota State, and that really took the wind out of their sails. I mean, Paul Rhodes last year thought we just get to six wins and get to a bowl game, be great. He had higher expectations for this team, and that loss to North Dakota State really set them on a bad course. Another bad punt by Downing. Maybe uh, the roughing the punter uh, the last time affected him right off the side of his foot. And so TCU will have the ball at its 41-yard line. We'll see what Horn Frogs offensive coordinators Doug Meacham and Sonny Cumbie come up with here. If you want the greatest pregame meal in all the sports? Come to TCU. <laughs> 19 suites filter into the Champions, Champions Club where we were. Uh, TCU also has six founder club suites sold at 15 million each. That's greasy money. Gumbo. That's gumbo. You know, Luganville is the only one that had the mac and cheese with the bacon on it. See right there on that plate? That, that was, we didn't, we didn't do that. We, the gumbo was good, though. I'm shocked you made it through that segment without making remark about my dietary needs. Here's Boykin <laughs> on the run, trying to get the corner, and he just scoots out of play at the 48-yard line, a gain of seven. Guys, there's a bolo out right now for the person that ate the most macaroni and cheese. <laughs> I don't want you guys to throw me under the bus. You, got, you just got done taking a nap at halftime. Let me tell you something. That was the buffet of all buffets. <laughs> Back to what the fans care about, actually the game. Here's uh, Aaron Green inside the 45 to the 42, and penalty marker down on the far side of the field. We'll see Baylor has the higher PR firm. You know, TCU, yeah. they can just invite the committee down for the That's buffet. Right. It's only a 30-minute drive. <laughs> Illegal substitution, defense, penalty is declined. Result of the play, first down. You know, speaking of Baylor, it's been... Uh, it's been interesting to see how both Gary Patterson and Art Bryles have handled this. If you saw Art Bryles today on game day, he was pretty fired up. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, about two in a row, two Big 12 champions in a row, but uh, that's if they beat Kansas State. But at the same time, he didn't really make a pitch to the committee, even though the school has hired a PR firm to deal with the national media. Here comes another double pass situation as Eccles Looper found nobody open. There's a penalty marker down. And he's tackled at the 39. He got three yards. Gary Patterson told us yesterday that he's going to let whatever happens on the field. Illegal formation. Offense. More than four men in the backfield. Five-yard penalty. 
first down. He said, whatever happens today, that'll be my message to the committee. Yep. Whatever you see on the field today and whatever the final score is. Well, and again, I think these guys, these coaches, they have to walk a fine line because, you know, you don't want to come out and cry about anything, right? And, and, and these guys, they know on the field between the white lines is, is going to matter at the end of the day. First and 15. TCU by 21. Boykin with another easy throw. Jawan Story, Florida transfer made the catch. Right down the street. Billboard that says Big 12 Conference, one true champion. Now that's not entirely true because if uh, TCU wins and Baylor, Kansas State winner of that game, you'll have co-champs and there is no Big 12 Conference championship game. No, I think it's unfortunate and I would love to see there be a championship game going forward now. You know, NCAA legislation does not allow that for teams that have less than 12, or for conferences that have less than 12 teams in their conference, but there's been some talk about changing that. Here's Green inside the 30. Got a first down to the 28. You know, I think the, in the Big 12 and the ACC have actually co-sponsored legislation to allow conferences with less than 12 teams to have a championship game, and I think that'll be addressed in, in the offseason. I think, I think they'll get it right. Because TCU and Baylor should be playing today. Huge hole off the left side for Aaron Green. Inside the 10-yard line. A fresh set of downs at the 10 as TCU looking to pull away. Well, you've seen big plays in this second half. We talked about putting the foot on the gas pedal. Doug Meacham got the message from Gary Patterson. They try a, a double pass from uh, Cameron. Eccles Looper and, and they're trying to make uh, they're trying to make plays on offense and get this score wrapped up. Boy can get a keep and he goes down to the 10. I do agree with you, Brian. I think, and it sounds like the Big 12 is pushing towards that, eventually having that, yep. that conference championship game. Just makes it better, makes this weekend better. It's already great with all these games having playoff implications, but to have a, a championship game in this terrific league. Green outside can't stay in bounds, pushed out around the six. Well, you know, the other thing that that when the other conferences look at it, say it might be a little bit unfair. You're, you would have been playing another top 10 team, right? Baylor and TC would have been playing each other again, just like Arizona and, and Oregon played last night. But they're also now having two and three bye weeks during the season, right? Just to, to be able to play these games on this championship weekend. So that's another advantage that, that the other conferences don't have. Everybody does play each other, have a round robin in the Big 12. But when you have a team that's Got two wins like Iowa State and struggling the way they are. Almost mark it down as victory before kickoff. Boykin. And throws to the end zone. Boy, he could have just, instead of throwing it away, he could have thrown it up for grabs. Echoes Looper would have caught it. He was open. No, guys, you make a great point on the bye weekends. If you look at Baylor TCU, TCU going into their game with Kansas, Baylor had already had three very strateg strategically placed buys. TCU had played for eight straight weeks. So my question then is, what is worse, having an open bye week or having an FCS opponent and actually playing a game? Because some conferences are knocked on that. Yeah. <laughs> some conferences mean the SEC, Luke's? Yes. <laughs> 23 yarder is good by Overcombe. And it's a 24 point TCU lead midway through the third quarter. And TCU battling for a share of the Big 12 championship. TCU's third year in the conference, a 27-3 lead over Iowa State. Baylor plays tonight on ESPN against Kansas State. TCU beat Kansas State, lost to Baylor by three. It was 17-3 at halftime, a quick touchdown by the Horned Frogs to start the second half, and then a field goal a moment ago by Overcombe. And Iowa State will start in the 25-yard line. You know, Art Bryles did all he could all week long to keep his mouth closed with regard to the head-to-head -head victory. And then he appeared on Mike and Mike Thursday. And here's what he said. What country do we live in? I think it's America. There's a conflict or a doubt. You put two people in the ring and they fight. There's a winner. If there's a question, you're the fastest guy. You put them on the track. And the fastest guy is the guy you pick. That's kind of how I see it. Well, we asked Gary Patterson about Bryles' quote yesterday, and he said, well, isn't America the land of second chances? <laughs> That's a good comeback. He actually told us he was going to save that for uh, yeah, you just, you, post game or tomorrow. You just jumped him. Yeah. It was I'm too sure good uh, not to use. <laughs> Here's Neely, and tackle for loss of two. 
TCU third in the country in tackles for a loss. You know, what's made this difficult, uh, certainly everybody knows, and everybody watched, and I went back and I watched every single play of that TCU-Baylor game, and, and Baylor won that game. It wasn't given away by anybody. Baylor came back in that fourth quarter. They were the more physical team up front on defense. They made more plays on offense. Give them credit for that win, and that win will matter come Saturday, come Saturday night tonight when they're making these decisions. But the problem is that TCU has gotten better after that game. They've gotten better each and every week, and that's what's making this conversation and this argument so difficult. Richardson hit as he throws, and it's almost intercepted again by Tejada, who had a pick in the first half. Third down and 12. Well, here's some of the numbers from that great game where TCU led by 21 in the fourth quarter on October 11th, but with 11 minutes left, Bryce Petty led a Baylor comeback, and then Chris Callahan with the 28-year field goal as time expired. There's a big fourth down and three play. Yeah. But uh, TCU elected to go for in a tie game, and it failed. Well, in my opinion, that, that game and that fourth quarter and that play in particular will have more ramifications on this playoff committee than any other play this season in college football. Richardson's pass is caught. Going to be close to a first down at the 35-yard line for Lazard. They're going to give it to him. Yep, first down. Good throw backed up from Sam Richardson. Lazard, who's been up and down today. We've seen him make some plays. We've seen him miss some. But without Devario Montgomery, they're going to need him. And Richardson throws it low and incomplete. What will be interesting is if there is an upset at one or four today. If Alabama or Florida State goes down, then the argument may not be TCU versus Baylor anymore. It may be, you know, if it's an Alabama that loses, Alabama versus Baylor to get to number four, or Ohio State, depending on what happens there. Or if Florida State loses, it's Ohio State and right. Baylor. Right. No, I, I think, I, I don't think there's any way that Alabama losing two games and not being a conference champion is going to get in. I think there's been a couple of uh, floors that have been set by the committee that are pretty clear. One is Florida State being an undefeated in the Power Five Conference. They're going to be at four, and if they don't lose, they're going to be in. The other is a two-loss non-conference champion, and I don't think that uh, that's going to happen anytime soon. Another third down and long. Iowa State two of 11 on third down. And an interception. It's picked off by Derek Kindred. He'll take it back for six. Touchdown, TCU. <laughs> 42-yard pick six as TCU adds some style points to a blowout here in the third quarter. This defense has been outstanding turning the football over. They're number one in the country, averaging over three a game. They have not only turned the ball over, but they have scored on defense. That's their 22nd interception of the year. Remember, Mallett returned an interception for a touchdown in that Baylor game. They had a scoop and score last week against Texas. And now it's Derek Kindred who makes the play that gets him into the end zone. He's made plays all year. He's made plays in a running game, passing game. See where he is, he's probably right about there. He's gonna read, read the uh, release of the wide receiver. Richardson tries to throw it inside. It's almost like he expected Jarvis West to come inside and not curl around the defender. We've seen that twice now, a miscommunication between Richardson and his receivers. It's hard to know whether that's Richardson's fault or West's fault, but there is no doubt Kindred is the beneficiary. So 17 points already in the third quarter for TCU matching its total from the entire first half. You look at their numbers in terms of takeaways and TCU had two defensive scores last week. A pick six by Caraway. You mentioned the uh, scoop and score by Lathan. And now an interception return for a touchdown for Kindred to make it 34-3. Well, and everybody, you know, looks at how many points are on the scoreboard for TCU, and I think it's all offense, but a lot of this, these games have been padded by their defense score. Another touchback, and Iowa State will start on its 25. Help us beat cancer. The V Foundation awards 100% of direct donations and net proceeds of events to fund cancer research. 
Go to JimmyV.org or call 1-800-4-JIMMY-V to donate. So TCU can breathe a little bit easier now, knowing that it's going to win this game. First of all, the question is by what margin? 34-3 to score midway through the third. The committee will chew on this for a few hours until tonight's Baylor-Kansas State game. Obviously keeping an eye on the SEC and Big Ten championship games as well as the ACC title game tonight. Tyler Brown is in it running back for Iowa State. Gets the carry and it's another negative play. About a half yard setback and Paul Dawson in there again for TCU. I love watching Paul Dawson play linebacker. He's well, as we mentioned in the first half, so instinctive as a, as a player, young player, you might have talent, speed, strength, but then as you go on in your years, you learn about offensive football, you learn when to take chances and when not, you learn the reads of the offensive line when they're pulling, when they're not pulling, and then you're able to make plays in the backfield, and Paul Dawson's one of the best in the country. Richardson hits West, and he's pushed out of bounds after a gain of about four. Paul Dawson is the only player in college football with over 100 tackles, five sacks, and four interceptions. He's going to play a lot more football after this season. Somebody's going to welcome him on his team in the NFL. And well, they've had a lot of defensive players selected the last five years out of TCU. Mentioned for Red, Darrell Washington, a second-round pick. Jerry Hughes, a first-round pick a handful of years ago. Dawson with 12 tackles in this game. Here's a deep ball, and it's on the money to West inside the 30-yard line. Good throw by Richardson. I give Mark Mangino credit. You throw an interception because Kindred jumps Jarvis West on the last drive. Well, you come out, run a double move. On the right side of your screen, Jarvis West runs the same route, and what happens, Kindred cannot help himself. There's too much cheese on that hook, you know, not to bite, right after you get an interception for a touchdown, and give Mark Mangino credit. Great throw, too. Mangino, former head coach at Kansas. Here's Wimberley, and he's chopped down at the 23-yard line, a pickup of three. And I like what Mark Mangino's done with his offense. I know they haven't won a conference game, and I know there's a lot of struggles from a talent standpoint at Iowa State and consistency standpoint, but Mark Mangino can coach football. There's no question. Paul Rhodes brought him from KU. A lot of the reason why is because Paul Rhodes, as a defensive coach, remembers trying to scheme and plan against Kansas offenses under Mark Mangino and it being very tough. Uh, he's proven time at a time that he can that he can coach and get production on offense and I think it was the right hire for Paul Rhodes. He took a perpetual doormat and got them into uh, a BCS game if you'll recall as Richardson goes to the end zone overthrown. There have been a lot of teams in the Big 12 that you know have had moments like Kansas where they had a stretch where they were good but what TCU and Baylor have done to get consistently good after being so bad for so long really a credit to Gary Patterson and Art Bryles. I mean these were two schools that it could be anybody for a long time. They have flipped the script. There is no question. Texas, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, all looking up at Baylor and TCU. And when you get that momentum turn and you start to get those recruits, look out. Third down at six. Inside the 25-yard line. Richardson with time, and it's incomplete. Intended for Lazard, and it's fourth down, and Iowa State will go for it here. It's going to be a big offseason for Paul Rhodes, too. you got to think about, you know, this, this was a disappointing season. As we mentioned, they wanted to get not just get to six games, but get more, and he needs to get this turned around at Iowa State. Two backs in the backfield on fourth down. Check the ball down, they might get a first down for it. See if TCU brings pressure. They rush four. And here's a pass into quadruple coverage, and it's incomplete. There was a couple underneath routes that looked to be available, but the pass downfield incomplete. Let's go to the studio.
34-3 the score here in Fort Worth. And TCU back on offense. They're going to go Wildcat here with Desmond White, a true freshman, in a quarterback. And they have Boykin in the slot right at the top of your screen. And here's a pitch to Deontay Gray. Wrestled down at the 28-yard line by Cotton Moya, and the helmet came off. No penalty, which means that Gray has to come to the sideline for a play. Well, that was a good sight for TCU fans, though, to get up, pop up, run off the field. Deontay Gray, they're going to need him. If they make that top four, they're going to need his playmaking ability. He had good speed there. He's been battling an ankle problem. A lot of the other receivers have been shaken up. Colby Lissenby has not returned after suffering a head injury. B.J. Catalan not playing today because of a head injury. As Boykin airs it out, flips it downfield, and it's incomplete. <laughs> there's some, there's some yanking going on there. There Kenneth it is. Lynn, and finally the flag. Kenneth Lynn fighting with Doxon. Maybe the officials are trying to figure out if Doxon was just trying to sell it at first or if he indeed was having his jersey tug. Pass interference. Number eight, defense. 15-yard penalty. Automatic first down. No, Ken Lynn got beat right off the snap. You can't, it's hard to run with Josh Doxson. He gets beat like that, and Lynn just reaches out. You have to. It's a good penalty. I mean, yeah, you know, you look at it and you say you don't you don't want to let that guy go down the field and just catch a touchdown. Instead, they get the ball at the 40-yard line. I think the field judge got the, uh, the flag stuck, though. <laughs> <laughs> Wondered what took so long because uh, looking at that obviously you can see the flag. Here's a little shovel pass to Gray. Brought down at the 47 yard line, a gain of six. Darian Cotton on the stop. You know, to, don't forget tonight you get Baylor and Kansas State. And look, everybody's talking about, hey, Baylor and TC, it's between Baylor and TC. What if Kansas State wins absolutely, that game? And absolutely. And they could win that game. Absolutely. They're ranked nine. You know, if you, if you look at Florida State, if Florida State were to lose, if Ohio State were to lose, and Kansas State wins and wins convincingly, who knows? And we've had them several times this year. On a road at Oklahoma, won that game, one of the biggest wins. Last few years for K-State as Boykin takes off and gets inside the 45. The road, being on the road doesn't seem to bother Bill Snyder and Kansas State. I think that'll be a better game than people think. Well, think about it. I mean, if, if for some reason, if Florida State were to lose, which they could, if Ohio State were to lose, which they're not even favored, if those two teams lose and Kansas State beats Baylor and beats them convincingly, the only team they would have to jump would be Michigan State. No, so they're in the conversation if they win that game. <laughs> I mean, that's in, in Michigan State didn't win their conference, so. Inside the 40-yard line is Hicks. Inside the 35. Again, a lot would have to happen for that, but a lot those would not two have games. to happen for, those two games. for Kansas State to win this game tonight yeah. at Baylor. Well, I we mean, don't know Petty. They, he's cleared, but what, what happened? My biggest game. question this game is, is what happens when Bryce Petty takes that first shot? I mean, I've been in that position. You come back from a concussion. You come back in a week's time, six days' time, uh, and you take a shot. You know, that's anything you, it's anybody's ball game. And I would... Uh, I would challenge anybody across the country to know who the backup quarterback for Kansas State is. Boykin open in the middle of the field is Story inside the 20 yard line. You guys, all these teams that are coming into this final week, whether it's Missouri playing against Alabama, Kansas State, we know what they're made of. Nobody's going to lay down. This is the biggest weekend in college football to this point. So much on the line for today, TCU, Baylor later tonight, Florida State and Georgia Tech. Those games are going to be great football games because there's monumental implications. So you know, if anything, a Kansas State's not going to beat themselves. Here's a wide receiver screen on a dangerous pass that's nearly picked off. You know, you think about it in years past. You might have one or two games that, that matter because it, it came down to the BCS selecting two teams and it was based on two polls and the computers. Well, now you've got what is currently 12 people making a decision on four teams, and I've got seven or eight games that matter this week as opposed to in previous years where you just have a couple. And I think it's great. I, and I think, uh, you know, if we have the BCS system this year, think about this. Alabama and Florida State would be one and two, and you'd have Oregon at three, and potential for Oregon to get shut out of a national championship game and have Florida State, who hasn't looked very good, Think of that scenario yeah. you know, when you when you start talking about the value of this new new system we have. 
And by the way, uh, you know, if the BCS system was in place, our researcher Brad Edwards did some work this week. TCU, according to the BCS formula, would be number four. So even the BCS would have TCU ahead of Baylor. Again, before Baylor plays Kansas State. True. <laughs> yeah. And obviously with the computers and everything, that would change, or the numbers would change. I don't know if it would add up to Baylor jumping TCU. Here's Boykin on third down and 10, going end zone. Doxson up high to make the catch. Touchdown, TCU. Now it's on, 40 to three, Horn Frog. Six foot four, 190 pounds, and all year he's done this. There's great coverage there. He just goes up and he's so athletic. Goes up and gets that football. Iowa State came with a, an all-out blitz. And again, great protection for Trevon Boykin and a great block by Kyle Hicks, number 21, the halfback. And a point after is good by Oberkron to make it 41-3. It was 17-3 at halftime. Brian, I asked you, all right, what uh, what you think? You said, eh. <laughs> you went like this, eh, okay. Well, this is, this is what we're looking for, yeah. right? We're right. looking for defense scores. You come out of their first drive on offense. They go right down and score on a long pass play. It's 41-3. to three. And this is the kind of statement that Gary Patterson wanted to make with his team. Uh, obviously, the committee is paying close attention to this game. be interesting to see how Gary Panders Patterson handles the fourth quarter. Does he leave his starters out there? Do they play the rest of the game? Do they keep trying to score touchdowns? Or does he give his backup some work? Not wanting to get injuries, perhaps. I wouldn't. I, you know, I, I'd play my starters through this third quarter, uh, and then I would start to get some of our reserves. Remember, this is college football, and and this is senior day here at TCU. You got a lot of seniors on this team for TCU that have put a lot of time, sweat, energy in practice on going to look teams for this team. Get them out there in front of their, their family, their parents, at home, in the last game they're going to play here in this stadium, and, and honor them. That's what the fourth quarter should be about for Barry, Barry Patterson. And also for the uh, the young players, it would give them an opportunity to get real game reps. You know you have those extra practices in between now and the bowl game, or bowl games in this case for TCU, but to get the young players some real game action here late would serve Gary Patterson well. I can tell you one player that better be on the sideline, that's Trevon Boykin. <laughs> um, you know, guys, I think the one thing to point out about this committee is with the BCS era, unfortunately at times, and in many instances, you may have had a, uh, may have had a box score assessment. And what you do appreciate, right, wrong, or indifferent, whether you agree or disagree, you have people that are studying the ins and outs of how the game has been played throughout the course of four quarters and throughout the course of the season. Because as we talk about this committee's blank slate each and every week, that doesn't mean that they're discounting any other area of the season, but they want to have a fresh approach, take things as they unfold throughout the weekend, but then make a cumulative assessment and always be able to go back, study things, and the coaches in that room, I think, are going to be a real positive influence on the others when it comes to the things of assessment of football teams that has direct reflection upon winning and losing. No question they won't discount what happened earlier in the year, but as that passes incomplete sales over the head of the intended receiver, they're, they're talking about the best four teams now. So those games early in the year are important, but obviously they're, they're trying to decide, okay, today, who are the four best teams? How might these teams match up? in a playoff scenario. Yeah, I don't, you know, I think when you listen to Jeff Long talk about it, he talks about, you know, the head-to-head -head hasn't really even come into play yet. You know, if you get to the end of the season and both of these teams are 11-1, and one, that's when the head to head is going to come into play. That's what we've all been really waiting for with respect to Baylor and TCU. Richardson on third and 10 throws and completes another punt coming. Everybody's talked about, okay, TCU played Minnesota and beat him and, and Baylor played Buffalo and those things do mean something but again that was so long ago I wonder how much that really is factoring into their discussion well I listen I don't want to see the kind of non-conference schedule that Baylor had nobody wants to see that kind of non-conference schedule anymore so I agree you should penalize them for that uh, but but you're not going to make the deciding factor of two 11 and one teams in the Big 12 and who gets in the into that top four based on the fact that one played Minnesota and one played Buffalo. That's not going to be the deciding factor over the fact that these two teams played on the field. Another bad punt. And TCU will have the football in Iowa State territory again. 
Greece, I couldn't agree with you more. The cumulative effect and knowledge of who played who and where they've played them and whether you had a buy, whether you had an FCS opponent, uh, nothing's going to come down to one singular factor. Uh, I just really believe with this committee, especially as it relates to TCU and Baylor, they haven't chosen to deal with the head-to-head -head aspect because they haven't had to. This will be the first time they've actually had to sit down and make that assessment. To this point, they haven't needed to. The interesting thing to me, though, is what, what prompted them to move TCU to number three last week. I think that's an interesting point that a lot of people are asking a question about. I think it's because Florida State looked terrible. I mean, that, that's, that's the end of the day. That's why they're moving. Florida State had to move down. Somebody had to move up. Deontay Gray on the run inside the 10. Another TCU touchdown. That would be nice for a quarterback, you know, like Trevon Boykin, that you can just take the snap, flip it out to a guy on a yeah. slip screen, and he run 45 yards for, for a touchdown. And uh, pad the stat. We're padding all kind of stats now, not only the scoreboard. Boykin over 400 passing yards today. He is a Heisman candidate. Walter Camp, the finalist. Davey O'Brien, finalist. Point after makes it 48 to 3. That's 31 to nothing. TCU's outscored Iowa State here in the second half. You know, you play this TCU team, you've got to defend downfield to the Josh Doxons of the world, and then they just throw that slip screen. And look at this. Gary Patterson loves to recruit track guys, and Deontay Gray is a great example. You get him in the open field, and nobody's catching him. Eight total catches in 2012 and 2013 combined. Deontay Gray, now this season, with 34 catches and eight touchdowns. You know, and I think you, as you look at these two teams, and I... I know there's a lot of ways to look at Baylor and TCU. I, I prefer to look at the teams on the field at a neutral site, okay? And I and I look at and I think the, I think the committee will as well. They'll look at these two teams. They'll say, well, you know, Trevon Boykin's a great player. Kyle Pet or, or, or Bryce Petty's a great player. Boykin's got a little bit more elusiveness from the pocket. The coaches on the committee, like the Tom Osborns and the Barry Alvarez, will say it's very difficult to defend at Trevon Boykin. I look at the defensive lines and Baylor's defensive line. I think it's a better defensive line than TCU. I think they're a more aggressive defense, but I think the back end for TCU and defense is better. So you got I think they'll look at it in that, that level of granular detail on that committee. At least I hope they will. Uh, to say if I put if we put these two teams on a neutral field, what's going to happen? Not not back in October, but right now. But again, the conversation by tonight may have nothing to do with TCU and Baylor. If Florida State loses or Ohio State loses, they should do that with any team. I guess is my point. And how much how much do you think Greece they will look at? How okay? Try to match it. Okay, TCU would TCU fare better against Oregon? No, no, or would Baylor no, 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 fare no, better no, against no, Oregon? No, I don't. No, no, no. Don't even say that. Don't even put that in their heads. You know they're listening. Don't even put that <laughs> in their heads. It's not about who matches up with who. It's about who is better. Well, that's what I'm saying. I, I'm saying looking at the two teams. Okay, is TCU better than Oregon? Would TCU have a better chance of beating Oregon, or would Baylor have a better chance of beating Oregon? No, I think based what, on their talent. I think what happens is they look at the, the contenders, right? If you're going to have for that fourth spot, you're going to have three contenders. You look at, yes, you go through all those criteria that we put up there, right? The strength of schedule, the head-to-head, -head, all of that, injuries even. And then you get to a point where, let's just say, it's Baylor and it's TCU, and you look at the records, and they're right, 11-1, and, and, and there's a lot of things that are very similar. At that point, what I want them to do is get to that granular level and say, this defense, this unit, and they've said that. This unit might be better than that unit, et cetera. That's, that's where I would love to see them make the decision. ESPN on ABC College Football, presented by Kate Jewelers, will continue after this message and a word from our ABC stations. Twenty-one hours away from the college football playoff selection show presented by AT&T. Sunday, 12.30 Eastern on ESPN. Is TCU in? The Horn Frogs are going to win. The question is now by how much as we start the fourth quarter. They outscore Iowa State in the third, 21 to nothing. Trevon Boykin, spectacular. A 31 to nothing, I should say, TCU outscored him in the third. Trevon Boykin is thrown for over 400 yards and three touchdown passes. Iowa State with a second and two, and a big hit by Marcus Mallett on Wimberley. He takes him down for no gain. 
The fans here in Fort Worth believe that TCU is in the college football playoff with this win here today. What do you think? Uh, they're not guaranteed. I'm sorry. I mean, they, they can win, but if you're asking me if they just had to come in and win and even win convincingly and they're guaranteed a spot, no, I would say they're not guaranteed a spot. Third and two, and this will be a pass play. Richardson incomplete. Go ahead, Tom. I know you uh, got an opinion on this. <laughs> Well, you know, it's interesting because we've talked today about Florida State ceiling it, and, or excuse me, their floor being at four. They finished undefeated. They should be in a TCU, obviously, lopsided win today. Say Alabama, and or we know Oregon won last night. How does Baylor get to three? If Florida State's floor is four and they're undefeated, regardless of what Baylor does tonight, how do they get to three? Well, if TCU ends up winning this game, which they're going to, and winning it heavily, how do they not get in? They're in, aren't they? Aren't they a lock? They're already at three. I'm sorry, guys. They are not a lock. And here's the reason why. is because the committee is charged with starting from scratch every single week. And that's what's going to happen after these games are played tonight. They're going to start from scratch. And there's no question Baylor can go from six to three. And this team can go from three to six. Wow. Our Pacific Life game summary. It was 17-3 at the half. TCU was leading. But then the Horned Frogs lit it up in the third quarter with 31 points. And this opened the second half, a 54-yard catch and run by Aaron Green. Then Derek Kindred with an interception return for a touchdown. And then Boykin to Doxson, jump ball, Doxson pulls it in. And then a 45-yard catch and run for a score by Deontay Gray. So Boykin with three touchdown passes over 400 yards through the air. He also has 44 rushing yards. And they're going out of the Wildcat here with true freshman Desmond White. And White wrapped up at the 28-yard line. Gain of five on the play. Boykin is still in the game along with the rest of the starters for TCU. Maybe one more drive. Now I would have had him on the sideline by now, but maybe they give him one more drive. See if they can get 50. Boykin on second down and four. Going to air it out and got a man. Caught inside the 35 by Emmanuel Porter, a true freshman that the TCU coaches say is going to be a dynamic player the next three years. Big kid, 6'4", out of Dallas. Yeah, we were talking with Sonny Cumbie, the co-offensive coordinator, and talking about, you know, we had Emmanuel Porter at X receiver, and then we moved him over to Z, and he's done a lot better. And what does that mean? Well, those, those two positions are, are different for wide receivers. They're asked to do different things, and uh, he just feels like Emmanuel Porter is going to be a great Z receiver in this offense. And since he's made that move, he's really made strides in his production. Aaron Green makes a man miss in the hole, breaks another tackle, and finally brought down inside the 15. No, you talk about Emmanuel Porter just being a true freshman. No, that's one of those guys as you make the jump into the Big 12 and your profile becomes larger, all of a sudden those types of prospects start to view you a little bit different. And that's how you start to build depth and upgrade your talent as a program. But I think the number one thing that Gary Patterson has done better than maybe anybody in college football is project players at another position from high school to college. And that's where coaches hone their craft who've coached at the mid-major levels. Jerry Hughes used to be a running back. Javon Boykin was a receiver. Sam Carter was a quarterback. What a catch in the end zone by Jawan Story, his first touchdown of the year. <laughs> that's four touchdown passes for Boykin. TCU has 54 points, about to be 55. Boykin, a new career high, 460 passing yards. And take that helmet off and give it to the trainer. <laughs> Your day's over. 30 completions for Boykin, that's a career high. And got a receiving touchdown. Four passing touchdowns. He's now responsible for 39 touchdowns on the year, shattering Andy Dalton's school record for a single season. And it's 55 to 3 as they continue to try and impress the committee with style points here on the fourth.
Senior day for Paul Dawson, Sam Carter, outstanding players on the TCU defense, part of two conference championships. They saw the beginning of TCU's Big 12 era a couple years ago, and the Horned Frogs will have a share of the Big 12 championship, along with either Kansas State or Baylor, the winner of that game tonight, which you could see on ESPN. Javon Boykin has been terrific all year. This one may be his best effort, 460 passing yards, third highest in TCU history, and he also has a touchdown catch. Here's Wimberly on the return for Iowa State. And he's brought down at the 25. You know, as good a year as Trevon Boykin has had, one of, the, one of the two games that he had that he didn't play as well from Gary Patterson's perspective was on the road in back-to-back -back games against West Virginia and Kansas. And, and Gary Patterson was saying that, you know, Matt Jokel, the senior who transferred from Texas A&M, a lot of people thought he was going to be the starter this season at quarterback for TCU. But Jokel ended up losing that competition, and Gary Patterson was telling us he got hurt. He just had ACL surgery. But Jokel has been a steadying factor for Trevon Boykin throughout this season. When Jokel got hurt, he didn't travel with the team to West Virginia and to Kansas. And so Gary Patterson said, hey, Matt, you are traveling with us to Texas because Trevon needs you on the sideline. And Trevon had one of his best games on that road against Tech. I thought that was a great story of, of Matt Jokel yeah. really helping. You didn't, you didn't come to TCU to be a backup, but it didn't work out. And Trevon Boykin really has depended upon Matt Jokel and developed a great relationship. He got beat out at, at Texas A&M by several people and, and went to TCU thinking he finally get a chance to play. He's also been injured. And... Uh, but uh, class act there. You know, Boykin, of course, had that seven touchdown pass game against Texas Tech, which you could argue, uh, obviously, is uh, more productive than today in terms of the touchdowns thrown. But overall, this may be Boykin's best game. Yeah, these two guys, huh? They've, they've been a pretty good partnership together. You know, they, they came into the season not knowing anything about each other. And they both uh, dove in with both feet. And, uh, and Sonny Cumbie as well and Gary Patterson from the head coaching position, and, and I don't think that any of them would have imagined that it would have gone this well. Third down and four here for Iowa State. And Richardson to throw. And it's nearly intercepted. Lazar, the intended receiver, being covered by Kevin White. Fourth down and Iowa State will punt. 55-3, TCU leads. Oh, Doug Meacham's got some nice shades down there, doesn't he? Those are some designer uh, shades. Got a little gold trim on them. And well, we talked with Sonny Cumbie yesterday. You know, they're a little superstitious here. They're going back and forth, letting the TV production team talk to one or the other. And right. then when they lost to Bailey, they said, let's just stick with one guy uh, because they won the next week with Cumbie. So then they just stuck with Cumbie. But Sonny talked with us yesterday about the different dynamic between the two, how they call the place together, but they have such different personalities. It's worked great. You believe that if you want. He just didn't want to talk to you. That was it. Thanks. <laughs> Sonny Cumbie, co-offensive coordinator, spent the first three quarters upstairs, but he's down on the field here for the fourth with uh, his team. Those two guys together in command. 55-3 and a new quarterback, Bram Kohlhaus, and a junior from Houston hands off to Trevoris Johnson. Kohlhausen was at Houston, then he transferred to a junior college, ended up walking on here. He's thrown one pass this season. And the right decision at this point yeah. to get Boykin out of the game, right? Absolutely. I think from here on out, you probably see TCU run the ball, take some time off the clock. And they do have their starting offensive line still in the game. That pass sails over the head of the intended receiver, incomplete. Well, tonight, Ohio State faces Wisconsin in the Big Ten title game, and the Buckeyes will be with a Heisman Trophy candidate, JT Barrett, injured late third quarter. See Devin Gardner, class move coming over. A dislocated ankle, lost for the year. Fractured ankle after he had run for two touchdowns and thrown for another. Obviously, that will have an impact tonight with Cardale Jones getting his first start. Here's a pitch to White, and he is past the 40 for the first down. We only saw a little bit of Cardell Jones last week. 
What did you think, and, and how do you think not having Barrett will impact the game? Well, tonight? Cardell Jones didn't do a whole lot of anything last week. I, I, I don't think people realize how hard that is. The job that Cardell Jones has this week, all week in preparation and practice, trying to get up to speed from a mental aspect, but also a physical aspect, and then to do it in a Big Ten championship game with the entire country watching, to do it against the top ten defense in Wisconsin with the playoff on the line. I mean, there's you couldn't you couldn't have more pressure from a quarterback. That's why I think Urban Meyer really needs to manage the game well for Cardale Jones. Big run here. Great stiff arm by Johnson. He gets the first down. Do you but, say manage the game? Do you say take the playbook and, and Make yeah. it a little slimmer. Yeah, make I mean, it easier. You got to pare things down. You got to do what Cardale Jones does well, which I think is throw the ball from the pocket. But more than anything else, you got to use the talent that you have around him. Jalen Marshall is their best player on the offensive side at the skill positions. Ezekiel Elliott needs to touch the ball 20, 25 times, establish that physical run game. Maybe you use the Wildcat like they have with Jalen Marshall, and then Cardale Jones is going to need to make six or seven throws, particularly in third down situations when that game is in the second half, if they want to win. That's that's what you're going to be asking him to do, and uh, we'll see. Well, we know Dave Aranda, we all have great respect for him as a defensive coordinator in Wisconsin. It's going to be interesting to see how he attacks Cardell Jones tonight, because that oh. Wisconsin defense is good. It's not a matter of... of, of how, but if, or if, but how, you're right. They're going to come after him. If Dave Rand attacks everybody. So and how do they do it, though, against him tonight? The, how often? The same way they've been doing it all year. They've had so much success on the defensive side. I think you might, in third down situations, bring a little bit more creative pressure because, you know, he hasn't seen a whole lot of real game reps. How they play, their discipline, their ability to produce week in and week out. They're not too dissimilar to TCU. They're going to pressure you. They're going to place the man. They're going to not make critical errors and give up big explosive plays. But when you consider what Cardell Jones is stepping into, if you go back to the Braxton Miller injury, imagine that offense that was around JT Barrett at that time. You hadn't had Jalen Marshall emerge yet. The offensive line certainly isn't what it is now. And so at least he's walking in as we got a sub fumble right here out of TCU out of the backfield. At least Cardell Jones is walking into a huddle that is vastly different than the one that JT Barrett first walked into. So he's got to go with the mindset of, I don't have to win this thing. I've got to divvy the ball around, be smart, and I, I agree with you, Grease. I think the package with Jalen Marshall out of the Wildcat is going to be a critical element to their offense. Cliff Murphy recovered the fumble by Travoris Green, so it stays TCU ball, and now Iowa State's Vernell Trent is shaken up. And I understand why everybody's talking about Cardell Jones and Ohio State's offense against Wisconsin's defense, but <laughs> <another> how about <laughs> Melvin Gordon against an Ohio State defense, which oh, has had it been up and down. They, well, they, they gave had some up. issues last week against Michigan, giving up long drives. They gave up two and a quarter on the ground to Tevin Coleman, right? They yeah. gave up yards to Jeremy Langford early in the year. They gave up yards to Drake Johnson last week. So you're right. I mean, everybody's talking about Cardell Jones, and nobody's talking about a Heisman hopeful. And uh, I think he will probably have more impact on the outcome of that game than, than Cardell Jones will. And Joel Stavi, you know, one of the more intriguing stories in college football. A guy that was benched, he, he had the yips where he couldn't throw the ball from me to you. And he's worked through that lack of confidence to build himself back up because he won some big games for Wisconsin last year as Trent is on his feet and hobbling to the Iowa State sideline. If Stavi can make a few plays, you know, Wisconsin would have beaten LSU if, if yeah. Tanner McAvoy would have just made some plays in that game. And then maybe we're talking about the Badgers as a, as a playoff contender. Their losses were LSU and at Northwestern. Instead, they're looking to play the role of spoiler and, of course, win a Big Ten championship and get in a, in a Big Six game. Well, and it's a great example, too. Just like TCU has gotten better, Wisconsin has gotten better since the start of the season. There's no question about it. And uh, finally implementing the kind of defense that Dave Aranda wants to run. Uh, these teams, that's what makes college football so, so, you know, so much fun to cover is that when you start the year, the teams are very different than they are at the end. And, and that plays back to this committee and how they're supposed to evaluate things at the end of the year, who are the best four teams? TCU going to keep it on the ground. Cliff Murphy, who's a converted defensive end, he's listed as a tight end, gets a carry here on senior day. Yeah. Boy, I wouldn't want to tackle him. Big man coming through the line. 288. <laughs> man, that's what he's listed at. Lutz was talking about, you know, guy Gary Patterson taking guys from one position to another. Uh, that's, that's a great example there. 288 as a fullback.
Here he is again. It took some arm strength, but they got him to the ground. Murphy picks up two, so third down as we near seven minutes to go here in a 55-3 game. TCU will watch tonight's Baylor-Kansas State game to see who the Horned Frogs will share the Big 12 championship with. And then tomorrow, 11.30 local time, 12.30 Eastern, they will learn their fate as to whether they are a part of the first college football playoff. The selection show presented by AT&T at 1230 Eastern on ESPN tomorrow. Over 700 yards of total offense for TCU and 55 points. A little trouble getting the exchange and here's an end around. Inside the 25 yard line and down to the 20s Phil Taylor. Come up a yard short of the first down at the 24. Great, you got Phil Taylor, he's a junior, he's in the game. They got senior Ramon Patterson, and some of these Jordan Moore, another wide receiver, some of these backups getting some, some valuable reps. And on the offensive line, and we haven't talked a whole lot about this offensive line for, for TCU, but this is a group, at least a starting unit, that's grown throughout the season. They got, uh, they had their hands full against that Baylor defensive line. It'd be interesting to see after this growth of the last month how they would stack up against that Baylor defensive line. On fourth and one, they get the first down. Johnson looking for a touchdown instead of get tackled at the seven, but it'll be first and goal for TCU. You know, guys, you look at the TCU sideline and it's sitting here watching Doug Meacham and Sonny Cumbie and how they're working, how they're talking. Sonny Cumbie's come down from the booth. You've got Curtis Looper, the running back's coach, who was at Auburn had been a part of a national championship there's a lot of experience on this staff and remember they made shifts offensively to their staff Gary Patterson did that took guys from leadership roles like Randy Burns who's called the offense had won a Rose Bowl and moved them to position roles and everybody's bought in which is one of the big reasons why you've seen the uptick in production on offense Kyle Hicks with a carry there got a couple Moves, you got an up-close view of those shades from Doug Meacham. Is that gold plating on the side of those shades? You know, they might be. I, you know what? You know what they tell me? They tell me he's clubbing later. <laughs> you guys are way too concerned with a guy's sunglasses, all right? <laughs> those two guys got the best hair to well, the offensive yeah, they're coordinator both going, of college they're, football. They're both going to the same barber, I can tell you that. <laughs> but <I'm> rarely. <laughs> Here's second down and goal. And the quarterback, Kohlhausen, keeping. And he got tackled by Corey Morrissey. For Iowa State, Morrissey a senior from Ames, his final game as a Cyclone. And, you know, he, he didn't wear 58 previously, but he's wearing that number now to honor Curtis Bray, a, a, the late former Pitt standout who was the Iowa State defensive end coach. He, he died suddenly from a pulmonary embolism in January at age 43. And so Corey wanted to honor his position coach by wearing his old number, the number that Bray wore at Pitt. It's a great story, and Morrissey's been a, a great player for Iowa State. It's been a tough year, but there's players like that that have continued to not only produce on the field, but be leaders off the field, and that's, that's a big reason why. All right, let's get back to some of these other games going on tonight. You already made your prediction of Georgia Tech beating Florida State. We talked about the Big Ten championship game. Who are you picking tonight? The Big Ten championship, I think, Wisconsin. Uh, I like I like everything that, that Gary Anderson has been able to do, Dave Aranda in that defense. Uh, but most importantly, the big guys. Let the big guys eat up front. That offensive line, I think everybody wants to talk about Melvin Gordon, but we know Wisconsin. When you talk about Wisconsin and playing them, it's going to be a physical game up front. And that Ohio State defense, as good as they are with Michael Bennett and Joey Bosa, Adolphus Washington, the linebackers and the secondary tackling, I think, is going to be a big factor in the game. And I think Wisconsin wins it. You know, it is uh, you know a sad story with JT Barrett because you got yeah. the sense the way Ohio State was playing, even though defensively they gave up some long drives to Michigan, that the way they were trending, yeah, they were going to be tough to beat in the playoffs, and they still might be if they win that game today and get into the playoff. As uh, Kohlhausen takes a knee, but yeah, that being said, I mean, if Ohio State wins that game against a very good Wisconsin team, they're going to be right there for the playoff, whether despite the fact that Cardale Jones is their quarterback. That's, that's my opinion. It's one thing I don't like about the college football playoff and this whole new thing is, is injuries, is the injury. And I don't, I'm not sure there's a way around it because you want the best four teams, but you also have some deserving teams like Ohio State if they were to win the Big Ten championship that I believe should be in there. Um, so it's, that's one of those areas where they've made a sacrifice. 
Classy move here by Gary Patterson. I mean, what, what's seven more points? How is that really going to matter? Let's be classy. Let's take a knee. Yep. Give the ball back to, to Iowa State and not try to embarrass anybody here. He got to see what Cole Hauser could do. They, they let Travoris Johnson, a redshirt freshman, run the ball. And then they got inside the 10 and said, you know what, okay, I saw what I needed to see. Yep, let's take a knee. 724 yards of total offense, fourth, fourth most in school history for TCU. TCU has won its first Big 12 championship, but will the Horn Frogs be in the college football playoff selection show presented by AT&T? We are inching closer to 12.30 Eastern tomorrow on ESPN, also on Watch ESPN, when the committee unveils its final rankings. TCU is currently third. Oh. Where will the Horn Frogs be tomorrow? Oh, people getting sneaky on the sideline over there, you know, you coach, first time you win a Big 12 championship, I think he deserves a little bit of a bath. Tyler Brown gets about nine yards. They will share that title with either Kansas State or Baylor. We meet tonight. <laughs> hey, Boykin should be the guy to, to dump yeah. the, the Gatorade bath. Yeah. He's kind of the uh, symbol of, of this turnaround uh, from the player standpoint after four and eight last year, bouncing around between running back, receiver, quarterback. Well, it's got to feel good for him, obviously, to the way that he's played. But also think about guys like Sam Carter, you know, been here for since that Rose Bowl game, right? And, and, and then to go down after you get out of the Mountain West and you come to the, the Big 12 and you, you go seven and six and then four and eight and then to be able to come all the way back full circle, those guys like Sam Carter, you know, I think Gary Patterson has got a, an affinity for them. You know, guys that paid their due to make the change. There's been so many conference changes for TCU, five of them, and to be a part of this one, I think is special for those guys. Gary, three minutes to go. And here's Tyler Brown, and he stacked up after a gain of about three. You know what I think is interesting about this day? You got Missouri playing in the SEC championship for the yeah. second year in a row. You got TCU playing in the, you know, winning a Big 12 championship. Those are two schools that people thought when the move was made, TCU from the Mountain West, Missouri from the Big 12, that they wouldn't be able to compete. Yeah, no way they'd be able to compete, right? In the course of three years here for, for TCU, they're at the top of, of the Big 12 along with Baylor. And, and Baylor as well, right? Out on the flat to Jarvis West, and a good tackle there. 
by Nick Orr, a true freshman. Got to have good execution here. So, so it looks like, you know, Trevon Boygan said, well, that, that might be too heavy. So you get the big guys to come <laughs> over to lift up that big Gatorade jug. But execution is important. There haven't been a whole lot of Gatorade bass here in the last two years for TCU. So you can't do it too early. And you don't want to wait too long. But I, I would do it when Gary Patterson's defense. I would not do it when his defense is on the field. He might get upset with you. Wait until they get off the field. Third and seven for Iowa State. And they're going to keep it on the ground. And they do not pick up the first down. Gain of only a couple. All right. Now that you've kind of had a chance to digest the full body of work, you've watched film, you've seen him in person, is TCU good enough, if it gets in the playoff, to win a national championship? I think, I think they are. I mean, I think they are a complete team on offense, defense, and special teams. I think that the moves that Gary Patterson has made have worked and worked beautifully. Uh, with a playmaker like Trevon Boykin, anything can happen. you got playmakers at all the skill positions and a defense that, uh, that has continued to get better as the season has gone on. I'm not saying they're the favorites, uh, but with this kind of talent, uh, they certainly can make a splash. And on fourth down, TCU's defense makes a stop. The Horned Frogs will get the ball back, take a couple knees, and the game will be over. And then tonight... About 90 minutes south, it's Baylor and Kansas State. College football primetime presented by Hampton Hotels. Share of the Big 12 title with TCU will be at stake and perhaps a spot in the college football playoff. So now, now, now you need somebody. He's on full alert. Patterson's on full alert now. They're talking there around the, the, the Gator race. Oh, he's looking. He's looking. You need a, a, a scout to go out and have a conversation or, or give him a hug. Somebody that's going to sacrifice. You might get a little bit wet, but, but at least you execute. <laughs> well, he knows it's coming. It's just meant, <laughs> and it's not like it's 25 degrees. And it, it's a nice day here. I, I don't think. Uh, oh, there, there it goes. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's cold, but. That was well done. Well done. Zach Allen in a quarterback, and I think he was confused whether to take a knee or run the ball. So he kind of did both. He ran and then took a knee. Congratulations to Gary Patterson, probably the national coach of the year. Four wins last year, 11-1 this year, a Big 12 championship, and perhaps a spot in the college football playoff. Before the year, there are probably 30 or 40 teams that experts were coming up with to be contenders for the top four. TCU wasn't even the top no. 60 or 70. And here they are, 30 seconds away from having a very good chance of playing at least one more game in the college football playoff. <laughs> Tough year for Paul Rhodes and Iowa State. They go winless, 0-9 of the Big 12 and finish 2-10. Gary Patterson, 11-1, 8-1 in conference play, a 55-3 win. Gary Patterson now with Tom. Coach, a convincing win, 55-3. Should you be in the college football playoff? Well, I don't see why they shouldn't consider us. Uh, this team's done everything we've asked to do all year long. We weren't even in the top 60 the first start of the year. So uh, everything that they've asked us to do, they're one of the best football teams in this country. So uh, I'm proud of them. They really fight their tails off. Third year in the Big 12. You're now a Big 12 champ. What's the last year been like as a journey for you and your kids? You know what? These guys, it really hasn't been this year. It's been really about two and a half years. Everything that we've gone through, everything on and off the field, and seeing them fight back and do the things they knew, I'm really proud of them. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy for Fort Worth. I'm happy for these students. I'm happy for our, uh, this group here because we come a long way. People said we couldn't do it. And here we are. Is your wife going to let you watch the Baylor game tonight? I don't care. Probably. She'll let me probably do whatever I want to. <laughs> All right, Coach. Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> well, you know, I think everybody that uh, is a fan of TCU will be watching that game tonight. Baylor and Kansas State on ESPN tonight. TCU beats Iowa State 55-3. That's it from here in Fort Worth. For Brian Greasy, Tom Lugan, Bill Art, standing ABC crew, I'm Dave Pash. We'll get you back to the studio for College Football Countdown presented by Nissan right after this short break.